Good evening, Model Railroaders, and welcome back to the Second Section Podcast, where it's just regular guys talking about model railroading. I'm your host, Andy Dorsch, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, Mike Ostertag. Mike, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? I am... I am happier than a dog with two tails. I got to tell you. Wow, um, that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, it's a new one. Um, coming off a pretty good weekend session with the section crew that we had a little uh, social get together. That was and fun. We got, that was fun, and we have a special treat for our audience this evening, and that's Boomer from the YouTube channel Boomer Dioramas River Road. Welcome, Boomer. How's everybody doing? <laughs> that's where we insert the cheering noises right Woo! <laughs> so right on i'm doing good good to have you back on the show boomer yeah, um i i see that we are live on location here yeah, tonight yeah, new yeah, setup yeah 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 we're sitting here at river road there just got the camera set up and like uh, Mike there, I don't have three cameras, but working on it. <laughs> I, I see I see the, the production crew is is doing good by you over there and, and getting you set up uh, to essentially have basically all all views covered, hopefully in the future yeah. here for, for River or for River Road. So why don't you um, for those of, of you who, uh, or for those who are just learning about YouTube and model railroading and, and don't know who you are, Boomer, why don't you uh, give a, a quick introduction uh, to those who, who may not know you that are in our audience and uh, tell them what you're all about. Okay, so which one do you want and which story? <laughs> They're all good. They are all good. Okay, so you mean how I got into the hobby kind of thing, or just uh, yeah, just maybe yeah. maybe just uh, you know what what you what your interests are, um, and and let's and let's go from there. We don't have to go all the way back to the days of yore, but um, maybe talk about the fact you got a YouTube channel and the layout that you're building and and all that fun stuff. Yeah, so you know I got into model railroad and you know just like just like everybody else, right? Like it was you know as a kid the hobby shop, you know two blocks away, yeah. right? And uh, the big plate glass window looking in at the trains, you know, back in the, uh, I think there was probably, wow, Lionel, there was O scale. And then Athern, you know, kind of came in and uh, yeah, I just basically got into it, but I never built a big layout. I just built small little sort of shelf layouts, right? And uh, it, it was just always something that ran a parallel path with my careers it was just the love for, you know, basically model railroading and model building in general, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, fast forward to, uh, you know, after a career in film and, you know, theater, et cetera, uh, I took a bit of a break and then, mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably about five years, six years, just sort of stepped away from it. Didn't have anything actually sold really? everything. Yeah. Sold everything basically. And, uh, you know, just took a big hiatus from the whole deal. Right. And yeah. then, yeah, you know, it was just, happened that way with my career I was just so busy and move moved i think one time and and just basically liquidated everything and then um i went back to school because i wanted to finish the degree and then when i got out you know um finished that part of things i was just bumming around the house i just you know sort of bored right and it was my wife actually that kind of <laughs> compelled me you know you should get back into it get busy do something with your life right <laughs> it's just, you know, yeah yeah and then uh you know i started river or uh, sorry glover road it was just a uh you know like just a uh, 16 inch deep eight foot you know shelf layout on a door skin yeah right? And uh, just started with that. And then, uh, again, my wife said, you should start a YouTube channel and show people how you build that stuff. Mm. You know, like just share, like just share, you know, the methods you use. And uh, I knew nothing about YouTube. I really didn't. Like over three years ago, I didn't. I mean, I knew it was around, but I just thought it was just a quick upload kind of, you know, right from your phone. Cat right? videos and yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I realized that it was a great platform for content creation and that people were building channels like with a brand and stuff. 
And initially I thought that I would go into, you know, just sharing a lot of the industry kind of methodology, you know, that I was incorporating into, you know, my models, like movie models and just other uh, models that I was building back in my museum days where I also worked, uh, you know, for a client that had a museum that we built on Granville Island back in the 90s. I don't know if a lot of your listeners know about it. It was the, called the uh, Granville Island Model Railroad uh, hmm. Sport Fishing and Model Ship Museum. And uh, that was in the 90s kind of thing. And we were just got out of the film issue. We were all guys, you know, just, just finished a, a movie kind of thing. Sure board and to start working for this guy building ships and a big model railroad a massive o-scale model railroad right yeah yeah so it was always part of what i did right like you know my career just building models all the time basically um and then i got into my own because i'm sort of semi-retired now and i just got back into model railroading again my sort of first love, really. Uh, I mean, I love building dioramas, but it was sort of the same to me, right? It was uh, like they both dovetailed, you know, the art of yeah. the diorama and the art of model railroading dovetailed for me on a smaller footprint, right? Like the way River Road is now. This is kind of the footprint that I always wanted to build on, right? Like a, a you know, 18 inch, two foot deep, you know, 25 foot linear railroad like a section of a railroad that i was familiar with and in this case sry rail link right close to where i live yeah so we're looking at um so we're looking this is ho scale then huh that we're that we're yeah. doing in? yeah okay HO scale, yeah 187 187 yep <laughs> so you you talk about um so model railroad obviously right in front of us but you do you do other stuff too um, so you said you did diorama and some, and what other things are you modeling uh, or building, I should say, while you're not uh, doing stuff on the model railroad? Well, actually river road here is actually takes up most of my time. Like, it's, okay. you know, it's, it's my primary sort of interest right now. Um, you know, I still feel just as passionate about it uh, when I first started. Uh, but I do break away once in a while and, and do sort of one-off dioramas, you know, like small, like like uh, one, like 12 inch by 12 inch, like one foot sort of signature scenes. I've always yeah. sort of done that. Uh, like I started out as a military modeler, like, you know, like in the 70s, you know, monogram. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, and uh, Ravel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ravel. And uh, when Tamiya came out, you know, was a big thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was Shepard Payne. Like, when you would buy a model kit, like, back in the 70s, you could buy, like, a monogram, like, Grant Lee tank, and there'd be a sheet in there, a color yeah. sheet of a, di of a diorama, right? Wow. Like a scene, yeah. And I was like, whoa, that is so cool, right? And then uh, I really got into that. And then, but I moved away. I kept doing the dioramas and, and uh, you know, eventually got into film because of it. Because I started selling the work, right, to private, like, collectors and stuff. But I moved away from the military theme, and I was I was sort of uh, fusing it into model railroads, like small kind of shelf diorama style railroads, and then doing nature, like, habitat dioramas as yeah. well, right? And just sort of, say, you know, sort of dovetailing them together as a kind of a, just a hobby, a, 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 you know, a little bit more sophisticated, I guess. But I always loved the sort of artistic, you know part of it right and of course trains right like you build a diorama they use these static displays but with trains you get the animation and uh yep. it just makes it all the more immersive right yeah that's yeah. fantastic so um you're i, I i've been tra been tracking your channel on youtube now for boy it, it's been a couple three years now uh, at very least three years um and talking about the dioramas that that you put together you you recently um i think on your community tab posted that you entered your latest diorama into a contest oh yeah uh silver creek yeah yeah uh, so, yeah yeah so that was at an ipms show like uh, they don't have any um nmra shows here like i don't no? know why they don't yeah it's I, I mean it's i guess it's fairly prolific still in the states like I know the membership I just heard is fifteen thousand members in the NMRA, and they're mostly older, mature 
modelers now, I think, and they've had a decline, but that's just because they pass away, right? Like they're, they're, they're veterans. They've been in the, you know, the association for a long time. And I don't know how prolific it is in Canada, but I never see any shows here, but they have a lot of IPMS shows, the International Plastic Modeler Society, right? Yeah. And uh, which is, you know, part and parcel to what I do or have have always done and still do when it comes to locomotives and rolling stock and scratch building buildings. And I've always been doing the diorama thing, but I haven't been to a show for 25 years, right? Sure. Like, like I just stopped going to the shows. And, but then this year, <laughs> I, you know, like I did Silver Creek, right? Kind of in between as an intern build when I was doing yeah. River Road. I thought, ah, just, you know, I'm going to do this on the side because it segues in with the trees and stuff like that. And then I finished it a few months ago. And then I, I was just thinking, well, the show's coming up. So I'll just drop it in there and go visit, reconnect with old friends. Right. And I did. <laughs> I met like people I knew from 30 years ago. Uh -huh. And we're still doing the hobby, right? You know, so uh, yeah. yeah, and and it won best diorama. I was like, oh, nice. That, that, that's a, you know, that's <laughs> you know, that you know, it's a little bit of a surprise to me, right? Because there's yeah. so many good, like the young people today that are doing, like the way they can paint some of them is just off the charts good. Like the bus, the figures. Uh, they do all the different genres. Uh, there were some train subjects there too. There was a double O, two mm. coaches. Re oh yeah, really nice on a small track. Uh, kind of like this we were talking earlier. Like there was a diorama with a couple of cars on. Oh on, wow! Uh, on uh, this kind of a thing, right? Yeah, it's a really yeah. nice piece of oh, almost nice. like furniture grade. This was my of... first layout back. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> Yeah, so you know what we're talking about? Can you live with your layout? Like, yeah, <laughs> like I built this just over, I don't know, just before Glover Road, right? Yeah, so I had nothing, right? And I thought, okay, so I'm going to build a layout. That's awesome. <laughs> so, this is, so, so, all you out there, there's no excuse, right? See, it's powered. Yeah, right. There <laughs> you go. My, I can run a dash nine on here back and forth. <laughs> Oh, a couple of them by the looks of it. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's how it started again was with this, right? And then, yeah, uh, yeah and then I thought, okay, so what should I do next? And, you know, I guess I'll show you, right? Yeah, yeah, let's so, bring out Glover Road. So then I started this like when I started the channel, right? Yeah. Remember this? It's Glover Road. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, there, it looks, still looks amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It just, I just hang it on the wall, right? So it's, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, this is a good time to show like how easy this was to build and how simple it is. You can stand it up in your closet. Yeah. Like uh, you can see that it's only like two and a quarter inches deep. This just old plywood pieces that I had that I just slapped this frame together at two foot centers, eight feet long by, by, uh, I think this is 16 inches deep or so. Yeah. Is it 16 inches deep? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's not, that's not that deep at all. Yeah. And all the buildings were built just like on River Road. They just sort of modular component. They just pop on and off, right? They just drop into place. So yeah. it's very port. So it's very portable, right? Yeah. Have, do you have any intention to taking that to a show at any point? Yeah. Well, that's the plan lately. I've been thinking about that. I was thinking yeah. that, you know, I just have to tweak it up a bit and then I can set it up basically. So it's a good exhibition piece. Or uh, um, I was talking to a, like there's a new train store actually in town here, uh, which okay. we were talking about earlier, but uh, they don't want to like the actual brick and mortar store is open, but they're going to pop the webpage soon. Like it's all professionally being done. They don't just don't want to spring it too early, but so that people can have access to everything. But I will be using this for tutorials and stuff, for live tutorials at you know, like at the store and things like that. Like in, you know, but you can see how this one. Like I had no like the idea was no funds. Like just whatever I had. Yeah. It's been like made everything like that. Like. Like uh, these switch machines I just made out of plywood, like really nice uh, Baltic birch thin plywood. Actually, from the RC modelers use a lot of this, right? Yeah, and for then, like actuation and, and like yeah. product cable. Yeah. Yeah, with the RC cables. They're pretty simple, right? But I mean, yeah. you can get Blue Point 
you can get blue point uh they're they're reasonable and you just hook up the rc cables to them and you're good to go right because you know because these layouts that's what, I use. Not, that's, what Mike, yeah. Yeah. that's what i use yeah and they're really reliable right oh yeah they have, great yeah and they have power routing and uh you know and the you know the Railroad that I model is a short line, right? So there's no CTC. So I'll probably do that same style with River Road. You know, when I'm ready to install the, like, I'm gonna probably use Blue Point and then just use cables like on the valance, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're Boomer. We're gonna um, we're gonna the the show format. You know, as as always, there's gonna be a ton of questions coming in from the. Uh, from the chat this evening, so I'll do my best to uh, field uh, filter those in for you, and um, uh, just uh, we'll take a quick uh, break here. David Winther asks, uh, "So what's the height? Uh, what's the layout height, Boomer?" Okay, here we go. Fifty-eight inches to track level. There you go, fifty-eight inches yeah. to track to track. So as level. I stand right here. This is exactly how, like, this is how I view. Okay, so here's the philosophy, right? Like, yep. shelf layout, like, shelf layout diorama style to me is in your face model railroading. Like, this is how I rail found. Like, when I'm, you know, somewhere on location and, and I see a switching operation happening, I'm on the roadside or alley and I'm like this. And this is how I experience it. So that's why I model this way. Somebody that maybe, you know, with, you know, Mojave Desert in California, they're up on an overpass. They see long, cold drags. Maybe that's why they do when. Maybe that's why they do, you know what, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that how we rail fan in a way kind of influences how we model. I mean, I don't sure. know if that, yeah. And I that's, think that's, yeah. that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, just how, how it, how you see it or your perception is, essentially how you're going to translate it into a, into a model or a diorama or artwork. That's a good point. I, yeah. I mean, the only probably caveat, you know, uh, since he asked the question about height, it might be for some people it might seem too high because people want to view, well, as you see the camera, the way it's set up, like I don't really see it that way. Uh, I see it. Uh, I don't know if you have any photos, Andy handy, but I might I have do. Yeah, I might have a few track ciphers and you can get a better perspective, not only from this view, but how I actually here. see it when I operate. Yeah, so this will be a good time. What I'll do here is, um, and, and please, again, pardon the, the show production here. So I'll, I'll go into screen share. And I think I have, it's this photo here. It looks like, a, like we're sitting track side. Is that right? Yeah, okay. So that's looking right here, like... Uh, I would just back this up a little bit. And as I look from here, that's what I see, but zoomed in a bit, right? Yeah. And, and uh, that, from where I'm standing to that wall back there, I'll just give you an idea. Yep. It's, it's 24 inches. Because wow. that building you know, that building's only a two-inch deep flat. So it, it's around 20 inches. That is remarkable. So let's. <laughs> so as you see it from the from the camera view, um, where the tow truck is, I'm looking down that angle, the alleyway. Right. Yeah. And so there's a this this white building here, and then there's probably another what eight inches behind that building, then yes. to where you have the the slums right. set up. So I'll put a tape measure. I'll show you how wide the back alley is. Okay. Uh, here. On the. Uh... Bear with so me the... here. Let's... Yeah. So see, up. there's about four inches, right? Yeah. So the idea was, is part of the reason why I do these flats like this in this situation is I don't want to lose, like, I want to create areas on the layout that's going to compel you to want to, you know, right? Like yeah, right. Like it gives so much depth and like what's going on down there. Like from here, there's this light coming down from a spotlight back there that, you know, casts a shadow. Like it just adds that deeper kind of dimension to the layout. It just adds a little more depth to the overall scene as you're standing up close like this, you know, that I really like anyway. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and the buildings are high enough that I haven't painted a backdrop in yet. That'll be at the end. Um, <laughs> there'll probably be a skyline to help, you know, finish that part of it. But <laughs> it's crazy, though. <laughs> you know? I mean, this is three be... years here, right? Or, or okay, actually, yeah. two and a half from the barge slip from down here, right? From way yep. down here. If you go back in the channel to vlog one, I think it was just about two and a half years ago, all the way down to here. All right. So I've That's really been really been going for it. Um, right. And and so there's nothing beyond the overpass. Like just out of view here, like you know, because we were talking about uh, you know, can you live with your layout, right? <laughs> it's sort yeah, of, right. It's a loaded question, eh? So we could talk about that, like um, like, can you physically live with the idea or the plan of your layout? Like, for me, it had to be small. Like, I don't, okay. like, I should say this because I know people have said, oh, Boomer, you know, he doesn't like big layouts, right? No, no, that's yeah. not true, right? I don't know who started that rumor. I think big layouts are fantastic. Like, I would love to operate on a large layout, but I can't do it. I don't have the logistics for it. I don't have, I don't have the finances for it, really. I don't have the budget. Um this layout feels huge to me because, you know, when you think about the operations, I'm operating at scale speeds. And in terms of operation, this thing's loaded, right? Yeah, right. Like two people can operate on this layout. There's two blocks, right? There's this main here that runs down to the warehouse, Axton Steel, and the brewery, right? Yeah. So I can still switch the barge slip because you see where 381 is here? Yep. I can all three, like... Well, these two are two leads to the barge slip without fouling the main. And I can offload and classify cars off the ferry while the guy's switching down here. And I haven't built or put in uh, the grain elevator and uh, IPEX plastics, which you would switch from here because this main becomes the lead because that's the way short lines operate, right? Yeah, They don't right. have the luxury. Like, they don't have the luxury of uh, not clogging the main or – separate leads and stuff like that like the main is the lead a right. lot of times right and you're at the end of the line here right basically i mean so you're 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 doing what they call math uh last mile um, yeah so last mile operations yeah i mean that's yeah. where all the action is right mike oh absolutely <laughs> you betcha <laughs> we don't call I mean, him the best the color guy, man right? in the you're game the right mike player, you know <laughs> like and you know this middle section here like i was talking about it i think on the last or did it uh or no the next uh next sunday's um episode i talk about my sort of philosophy why i did this like why i kind of compressed these two scenes and uh have these three tracks here because I, I was trying to split the layout, right? Because they're two different areas with like 40 miles apart. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like you talk about compression. Well, there's deletion too, right? You remove a whole section because you can't model it. And you want to, like I talked about how this was a real challenge. Like this whole transitional zone was a real challenge. Uh, when I was back, if you go back under videos, you'll see where I just had this built, this sort of old growth forest section. And sure. I had no, I had no idea what I was going to do here. I didn't know how I was going to solve it because I had to end this. I had to end this forest thing. Otherwise, I would have had to carry it all the way down. And there's no way I'm going to build this kind of intensity another eight feet. Yeah, you know, right. It's, you know, it's a it's a lot of work, right? <laughs> like it is like doing trees like that, and just it's a oh. lot of labor. Yeah. So uh, and and some of the. <laughs> Some of the people were commenting and they were great too. They're saying, Hey man, how are you going to deal with the, you know, the, this rock area? And I said, I don't really know, but I'll put a wall in there. So I put the <laughs> retaining wall, but I didn't even know I was going to put the, you know, the slum landlord scene in there until I went down to new West where the tracks run in front of these buildings. Yeah. Exactly like this. This is what it looks like, but without this warehouse here, there's a parkade here actually. Huh. So I deleted the parkade left the tracks because they worked for this scene down this way and then just dropped in the slum landlord scene, which is really close to the prototype. Like the next two videos, I cover the whole build and paint of those and stuff and my thoughts behind that. 
But it's a bit of a relief because it was a real um, kind of uh, block. You know, I was really blocked with it for a while. I think I mentioned it for about a, three weeks. I didn't do anything because I, I just couldn't get my head around it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I remember you telling me about that and how you had to essentially put it down. Yeah, didn't I did, you have, yeah. Didn't you have ambitions that the the diner that you built was going to go there? A lot of people yeah. are asking, where's the diner? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. right, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so I don't really want to let the cat out of the bag yet. <laughs> so, Dusty, where are you, right? But, uh, yeah, right, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's sleeping, right? Yeah, the cat, right. I, the I told her about the show, and she goes down for a sleep, right? Yeah. But, um, so, I can just lift this out, and the diner drops right in. It actually looks pretty cool. I'm going to show it, though, in the next couple episodes or whatever, like in that oh, series. Man. I'm going to show it then. And I was really surprised. So when you pull these more modern poles out and you lift this warehouse out with the slum landlord flats and the and the diner, it actually makes sense because these buildings are actually from the 20s, like 1910, oh, wow. 1890. Like they've been covered over three or four times, right? Like they're rotting buildings. Like they're like I went down and researched them. Like they're, oof, you know, they're pretty rough, right? Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, anyway, the, <laughs> the title sort of says it all, but, but, um, yeah, so the diner does look kind of cool in there if you want to be whimsical, but, uh, the actual industry that like Ipex plastics this is the next big build this winter I'm doing, uh, this building will be here because it, 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 like, it makes sense prototypically for me, right. For yeah. ops and stuff, but you know, on, on a, on a happy Sunday, I can drop the diner in there. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i sent you a photo of it but yeah i might I don't have, think I don't, I, I don't think i have the diner in in the care package you sent us here let me so, just well, i'll cycle through them go ahead mike so like when you go out and you, you're all messing around talking with the guys on the sroi i mean your videos i mean you see them i mean they know who you are they they talk with you and stuff yeah, like oh, that yeah. so and all of a sudden they go by you turn around and you say huh, well, that needs to be on the layout. <laughs> and then the next thing you know is you're taking pictures of some absolute arbitrary thing that you never thought you had no intention on ever going down and taking pictures of. How do you, when you do that, how do you come back and then all of a sudden start looking at your layout saying, all right, how do I get to incorporate this because this is here and we need, I, I need to be able to kind of put this on the layout, but how am I going to do that? Like, what's the pro, what's your thought process for going through that kind of stuff? Okay. So that's a great question, Mike. So here's the mock-up of the slum landlord that I was, mm. you know, like dead, like, like blocked, like literally blocked over. Like uh, when I did the, uh, you know, this retaining wall and I, and I'd already built the, you know, this warehouse, right? Yeah. Uh, I just had this back there like a, about a month ago or so or six weeks ago. And it was like, okay, is this really going to work? Like this is, right? So I start off with just concepts like this. And then I just stick them in, right? Like this was back here, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're looking at it and it's just white, right? And it's not like there's no color. There's no... Mm -hmm. And it just start like, I think it's, I think a lot of people do that. Like, I think a lot of people do it and they don't even realize it. Like you just use squares and blocks of wood, like whatever. And you're composing, you're trying to, trying to find a balance. Like, how am I going to, I have an idea what's going to go in here and shapes and stuff, but I have no clue what they're going to be. And then like with this building, I had photos of it, but I wasn't sure if they were even going to go there, but I knew I had to have something higher than, like I wanted something, you know, because I talked about how you stack your scenery, right? Like when you're looking, like I'm down trackside here. So when I'm looking at this, like life, it's much better because it's peripheral view. It, like it makes sense because as your vision goes up, there's always something there, right? Like it just yeah. enhances the depth, right? Like it cheats yeah. it. And it, uh, you know, for me, pulls me in. So, 
you know, like I was saying, like I think Lance Minheim, like he's a big uh, fan of the slow prototypical movement. You know how, like when a locomotive pulls up to a car, they stop. You know, I don't know, f- five feet before the car. Like I've watched him do it. The guy gets, you know, the conductor gets out. He's got a radio. Like it takes way longer than you realize, right? To do what? Like to drop <laughs> one box car, right? Like right. There, you know, it's like, geez, you know, these guys have been here for half an hour, right? You know, pulling a car and then dropping in the load, and you know, there's way more there. So I think that's part of the philosophy of the shelf layout too, right? Like, you know, for me to be able to live with this layout, I have no problem with it because I've accepted this kind of philosophy of model railroading. And Mm. I'm not like, I'm not anxious or stressed by space because I've already built it. Like, here's a, uh, like, I've already built all this bench work. Like, here's a a, uh, wooden, like, mock up of all the bench work that I did, right? Okay. Yeah, right. just, like uh, just out of balsa wood, right? So the, there was a question then that um, came up earlier. So how much how much time do you put into? And I, I'm going to have a couple of follow up questions with this. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how much time do you spend on on research, and and then the like this development before you actually. I guess I'll use the analogy, put pen to paper, right? Or to actually start constructing models. Is it, is it like, like, let's say, is it mm, 75% research and planning, 25% execution, or is it eh, whatever, you know, it's just kind of, I kind of go with the flow. And if I need to do more here, well, is, it, well, that, is, it, is it, that's kind of where my question ties in too. I guess it's kind of the two questions kind of go to, together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so a good example would be what's going on beyond the overpass. Like, I want to put IPEX plastics in there, but before I made that decision, and I know some people disagreed with it, but the plan was, like, even the plan on this, uh, like, the plan on this maquette model, you can see, is not even what I did. Yeah, right. Right? Like, this is where the barge slip is, right? Yeah. I was going to put the yard, the SOI yard here, at the very beginning. Right. And then I moved the yard was going to be down here. Right. And right. Then I thought, well, I'll move it down here. No, it won't fit. Like it doesn't. So a lot has changed. Right. Like people have asked, like, where's your, t-? I mean, I have a track plan at the back there and it's, it's close, but it's changed a bit. Right. Now what's sure. going on beyond the overpass that I haven't, I mean, it's in, it, it's already planned. It's already decided. Uh, I have the cardboard mock up further back to like some parts. So I'll be cutting wood very soon on that. So, like, I would drive by Duncan, like Duncan Way, and spend like an hour taking photos, just walking around. Got up on the overpass, shooting down. So I have the best research I have on any subject here is IPEX plastics. Hmm. Right. As you're getting more into it, research and stuff, you just get more thorough at it. Right. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. So all that is in place. I already have my photos. And so I'm making cardboard mock-ups. Like, I don't do that many drawings because you don't really need to. You have to physically try to fit the model out of cardboard first into the space. Like, you might say, oh, this is not going to work. So you got to cut a section out, right? Like, um, with this, with the slum landlord scene, like, I never added this part on. There's a hole, like, this part right here. Like I explain, yeah. like I explain all this in the next episodes, like really go into it. And I describe how I added another two inches there. Like it's just a process. Like it doesn't really matter how you do it. You just do it, you know, whatever you works for you. Right. You know, like, and then once you get that, that, that space occupied with your building, then you, then you start cutting plastic or wood. Right. And you might even have to adjust during that phase as well. Right. Yeah. But, so it's but not... once you get it, though, you know, though, right? It is a process and different, might be different for everybody. But once you get it, then you know, okay, I got the size, the composition of the building. This is it. All the rest doesn't matter because I'm just going to work through that as well, right? Yeah. So then, then I guess for some of our, our newer viewer or our viewers who are new to model railroading, we a lot of people that are, I guess, been in the hobby a while talk about composition, scene composition, right? You know, so essentially, 
the the whole the whole process to go through that is do the research, play with stuff, tinker with it in the space. Do you come? I mean, it's not it's not an exact science, right? You you no, you take the time not. to to look at it and and play with it, and then sometimes it doesn't even turn out. Um, and then you have to, you know, adjust the model even as you're building it. So it sounds like it's okay to make, you know, to fail or, you know, to make mistakes and then, you know, place the building blocks in a different pattern and see, see if it looks better. You know, you should give yourself the freedom to do that. Cause that's exactly what you're doing here. Correct. Yeah. Like, uh, if I could give a shout out to Dennis at Otter Creek there, you know, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah, like he did an episode a little way back. If you go to his channel and you roll back in the videos, he did a like maquette model out of, uh, I don't know what he used, like some kind of plaster scene or, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. You can use foam. You can use blankets or towels or whatever. But he did this, you know, maquette model. And a lot of people would say, you know, why, well, you know, why would you take the time to do that? Well, he solved, like uh, he explains, like he solved the composition of the town. Yeah. By, you know, by doing that exercise, right? And those are practices that go way back that were forgotten, right? Like I did that with the bench work. I built a frame like a, a, a one inch or I think it was two inch of the foot frame because I wanted to see what it looked like in the space, like in a, in a miniature, like a quick mock-up. Will this, like, what will this look like? Will it work, the footprint? I designed the footprint and the shelf work of this layout first. I didn't design the, I had an idea what I wanted to do, but. I had no idea exactly on the track plan. I have the track plan now, finally, like it's in stone, right? Like uh, yeah. you might be able to change things on this, but the way it works and the way it's going to operate is exactly the way I want it to operate. So it's going to be, the rest is going to be laid up that way. Like, I think there's three runarounds on this whole uh, line that, but you can't tell that they're runarounds. It just looks like true <laughs> prototype yard track, right? But they're there. Believe me, like if I could just point out another reason why I can live with this layout is if you see, I think I mentioned like, like this, like this is the main here, right? Yeah. And then it, like it runs down here where the yellow paint is, but I can actually uh, operate an, on, on actually three blocks, like in 26 feet. Jeez. You can have three operators if they were going to operate like they would in the real world. Okay. You got to hold tight, man. Okay. <laughs> <It's> easy, <laughs> right? Like if you operate that way and that's, you know, like that means something to me, like that allows me to say, okay, I already have the track plan down and I'm okay with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I'm not unsure about it. I'm unsure about the scenery, but the track plan is already written in stone. I know exactly what I'm going to do on the next section. I know, know what's going on there, which, yeah. um, you know, I'll, I'll be covering that as well. Like okay. with IPEX, yeah, with IPEX plastics, uh, just so I mentioned here, like this three-way, like just a three-way three -way turnout. Yeah. Um, I can just tilt this down a little bit. There you go. So this three-way, like this one here goes to IPEX plastics. The center one will goes to IPEX plastics because there's two, there's two tracks. And then this other line joins up and then there's a, another turnout that branches off to the grain elevator and then the CN or CP main, but you'll see all that, right? How it works out. And then it's a three or well, maybe two track stub. I'm not sure yet how far I'm going to carry the spur down, but it'll be a stub end to cassette staging, right? Or yeah. the, the uh, add on additional, cause I have more, like more room, more spurs. but I'm getting it in writing first. <laughs> I was going to say, did you get the land lease from the land manager? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, right? So it's a, that's so, part of it, right? So Ralph Franzetti did have a question, and um, just tilt this camera back. Yeah, more. and and you may want to buckle up for this one. So oh, oh boy. Boy. <laughs> okay, Ralph. <laughs> we have to give Ralph a hard time. No, we don't. Ralph's been a good friend of the show. So yeah. So you know how we like to put labels on on things, right? So. Um, in the argument of of so you're you're talking about scene composition, getting it to look right may not be a hundred percent accurate to the real world. Talking about making deletions, this, that, and the other, is do you do you throw a label on it, prototype or freelance, or is that really, or are you are you thinking of something else? Okay, so 
Ralph raises a really good point, right? Um, he's, you know, he's looking, looking at, at the whole definition of prototype versus freelance at the end of the day in the sense, I mean, it, he can correct me if I'm wrong here, but is it really a prototype at the end of the day? There's so much compression going on. There's so much artistic license. Uh, the turnouts aren't even the same number. The track spacing isn't the same. So he raises a really good point. Like no layout is absolutely prototypical unless it's a complete static diorama with a box car on the siding that's built to, you know, rivet counted prototype specs, right? Like then you could sort of say this is a prototype model. But as an operating layout, there isn't I like to see it as like like section one down here, like this is very strongly prototypically like influenced, right? Right. Like, I don't know if you have any photos there, but like when you look at that section from certain angles, Here. you know that's Anastas Island barge slip because so I was so, yeah, so heavily. I think I influenced. have one here that I, I think can the bring opening up. one was it the thumbnail? Yep. But, yeah. But the key word you said there, though, Boomer, is influenced. You know, it, that that's huge. You know, it. Yeah, okay. So. So if you were hovering from a helicopter right there in the real space, looking down, that's what you see, except that Axton steel building way down there, like to the end of that barge slip is an eighth of a mile, right? Yeah. Okay. But it's only 10 feet in HO. If you do the math, go to Google Earth, you'll see that I compress that. Uh, like the problem, 800 uh, feet. Yeah. yeah, the pro yeah, so that's 10 feet to the where the um extractor is, like the far left, right? That part of the wall, like right to the door that you see. Um well you'd see it uh, when you zoom back to where I am. I'll you I'll, you'll see the door right down to the corner. Yeah, you see down here, right? Where right from my hand. All the way down to axe and steel is 10 feet. So if you go back to that photo. Yep. I'm going to go back to that photo eventually here. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. Sorry, Andy. Andy's <laughs> juggling the photos there. Good job, yeah. Andy. I'm uh, doing my so, best. <laughs> so uh, we, so that you can see that's a 10-foot run. So is that prototypical? No. Because the brewery, you wouldn't even see it. Like if you're hovering in a helicopter or a drone looking at the end of that barge slip, what would be there is the uh, is the middle warehouse that's behind the trees, which I crushed like 90%. <laughs> right? I, 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 yeah. I squeezed it, you know, by 90%. So, and the brewery wouldn't even be in the scene. Right. So is it prototypical yeah. that way? The footprint? No, the foot the footprint is not prototypical. But the actual spirit of the scene, right, is 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 heavily influenced by the prototype. Now you talk yeah. about that in, in a lot of your videos, especially with that one warehouse that you crushed. I think <laughs> I, I like I like how you turn coined that term. I crushed <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah, I crushed everything. Right. I mean, Gotta Tom, like it. Tom, like Tom, you know, Tom Klamowski, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, look at his layout, man. I mean, look at his layout. It's a work of art, man. It's a masterpiece. Like he took, like he captured the whole, like when I look at his layout, I think, man, like I can see where, like, I don't know where he did it. Like I can't get into his head, but I understand that he's been in the game long enough that he's, he, he knows what this means. Right. Yeah. Taking a scene and going like that well, so yeah. that he can fit the two signature scenes or operations in a certain footprint space. But he still relied on the prototype, though. He had reference, and even though it's a lot of freelance practice in the build, he still was coming from, like, as a jumping off point of the prototype of the railroad, which is why it, it has the spirit of the prototype in it as he created it, right? Like, yeah. he in, like like it influenced his hands and his his work and scenes and stuff and that's so Ralph raises a good point if it's to answer his question <laughs> uh, yeah there is no real you know prototype footprint that's a hundred percent accurate 
uh, you know, that you can really say, right? But just simply because we don't have the room. Yeah, and besides, all... it would be boring. There you go. <laughs> it would there. be boring, right? Like the only prototype railroad I, I think that I could see, and it's not even really a railroad, but it's classified as that. Is it does anybody remember seeing that one deal where they have the that trans they put a trailer on a flat car and they move it like 150 feet from one end of a bumper to another end, and it's at this facility, and that's to accommodate some kind of th it's literally like three 89 foot flat cars long and it has like a track mobile that moves it back and forth and that's right. it and it's, it's like some tax thing but it's classified as a railroad and i can't remember if it's in canada or if it's in like the eastern united states someplace i can't if anybody in the if anybody in any of the section crew knows what i'm talking about yeah throw it out there because I read it one time and it was like, I'm like, okay, this is the only true quote unquote railroad you could possibly model <laughs> one end to the other prototypically, you know, it, it's, it, and it doesn't even have locomotives. It's like a static car. It's like yeah. one car. It's like one car. So it's just, it's just nuts, but you're right. Like even on my freelance railroad, I take elements of what it's in Canada. Okay, yeah, thanks, Andy. I knew I knew somebody Eastern British. That's that's in Eastern British Columbia. Oh, nice. So I, uh, you know, I've I've taken portions of you know because I'm you know modeling last mile too, but there's only so much I can fit into my space, and and with modeling a larger scale, it's it even becomes, you know a bigger deal to have to crush things down. You know, that's going to be the new thing. It's going to be <laughs> crush, crushing, crushing the hobby is going to be the, the, the yeah. is going to be the new thing. Tom Tomaski, you, he says he's using boomers words. I crushed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he did. yeah. He did crush it for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, so, it, it just gets, it just gets to be where you see all sorts of things that you want to, in you know, put onto the layout. But yeah. then you just, man, I just don't, boy, that would be cool here, but uh, I just don't have room for it. Or, boy, you know, if I did this a little different, and then you start getting in your own head, right? And and that's where analysis paralysis comes in. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of layouts tend to, to stall, because the decision-making process gets, you know, hindered by, too many cool things to have to try to fit onto a small space. Yeah. Well, you really nailed it, Mike, because you, you know, like, like, like you just kind of sort of described, can, you know, can I live with the concept that I want to build my layout? Like I, like I'm in this for the long haul. Right. Right. Like, right. um, I think I mentioned that, you know, like I've built, uh, how many, I, I've, I think I built about eight layouts or so, like over my, uh, career or whatever, or, you know, <laughs> journey, but, um, you know, and some of them were fail, right? Like there was a few that were pretty good, but it always takes that, you know, the other, like the last layout to get to the next one, right? But there's a point where uh, I think it happens to everyone if they really, really love the hobby enough and they want to pursue it, uh, that they finally do get a track plan in place that they really can live with. And like, it doesn't have to be huge. Like, you know, um, <laughs> and once again, I think big layouts are great, right? I really do. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with a smaller layout, you know, like I am so like captivated and like immersed in this layout. Like when I come in in the morning, like I, like I don't run trains for two weeks sometimes, right. Or whatever. Like, it doesn't matter to me. It's railroad. It's what I love. It's what I like. And it's here. Right. And uh, like, I can just stage things and go, Oh, that's cool. You know, right. Like I saw that the other day or whatever. And, um, like, I think with, you know, Mike, you mentioned about deleting scenes or crushing. Like, I had a real dilemma when I went from Anasis Island, and now I want to go to Langley. Yeah. Like, that's, that's 45, 50 kilometers. What? You're going to leave out, you know, the classification yard. You're going to leave out the shops. You know, you're going to leave out, you know, B&L Sons. You're going to leave. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. here. Like, in order to live with it. I can have Anasis Island. I wanted a, a glimmer, 
you know, a glimmer spirit of New West because they pass through there. That's where their shops are. And I want to get to Langley. I want to get to Ipex Plastics. And ultimately, I want to get the Glover Road version to the Milner Grain Elevator, which they just tore down and I taped it. Oh, like, oh like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the excavator <laughs> uh, machine, like uh, it's gone. It's gone. Oh, my God. Right? And uh, Two years ago, you were standing right there and they were operating I, it. Yeah, I know. And I have a loads of research on that one. And I even started the model. The model here, I'll grab it. It's right here. Um, <laughs> I love this. This is awesome. Yeah, like this I, is I, part of it, right? Like this was the first yeah. model that I built for, uh, 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 this is the first model I built for Glover Road. And it was sort of whimsical, but it didn't do it justice, you know? And I thought, no, no, section three on River Road is going to be dedicated to the Milner Grain That's Elevator awesome. Ops. It's one spur, right? Yeah. With three, you know, with three hoppers. They would drop three hoppers there every um, – maybe I can put this down right here. Uh, they basically um, had three hoppers every week coming in here, like all chicken feed, right? Yeah. Like the trucks would come in and off it would go to all the chickens in the Fraser Valley. It's just there are chicken farmers everywhere, right? Everybody eats chicken. So, <laughs> and uh, Yeah. And it was a like a uh, you know a landmark like That's in Langley on Glover Road. It's like I don't know the year of its origin. It goes back quite a ways. Um, I think it was in the twenties they built it or thirties. So there were three more bins on the back that I'm going to build. Hmm. And it was the coolest thing on Crush Crescent and Glover Road, right? With the big uh, okay, remember this here? Like yeah. this is uh, this is, was just behind it, right? The big Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's cell tower. Mo yeah. The modern world and this there, right? Now this is just there. This is gone. They, mm. they, they knocked it down, right? And I'm so glad that I, uh, you know, got all the photos and started a model of it, right? Because I want to preserve it. It's a historical, uh, you know, landmark, sort of the center of Langley out where I live. So, so I'm really glad that uh, I was able to, you know, Get a start on it anyway, but that's going to be on section three. Pass Way down. Plastics. Yeah, like where the intersection will be in a crossing and stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then beyond that is I got to sign, get some sign off on expansion. <laughs> <laughs> right? new, you know, a so. new lease must be penned. That's yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, um, okay. So since I'm on this topic about expansion, I want to read one, one little small, tiny paragraph. Yeah. From this from this article that was in uh, uh, what's the best reader? There, right there, expandable track plans by Ian Rice, right? Yes. Can you see that? Okay. A uh, little uh, there. Now we got her. Yeah. There we go. Yep. So uh, Ian Rice, for those of you that know, like he passed away like a few years ago, and he's published. Quite a few books. Uh, I think Tom Tom's probably read some of these. Like uh, Tom just put out a book too, right? Klamoski. Tom Klamaski with yep. the right uh, size layout. Anyway, uh, he also did a book uh, that you can get on eBay called uh, "Small Practical or Small Smart Practical Track Plans," which was the one of the books that really inspired me actually before I started Glover Road. And uh, he wrote here. For starters, sectional layouts are easy to move, modify, or extend. This cuts down on the unnecessary destruction of models as individual sections or entire layouts can be moved or sold because of their built-in portability. So, like, his concept was to build, like, in sections, right? Yep. Yeah. Like, like I won't do any scenery. Like, I'm ready to go there pretty soon now, like, up to the overpass that's up here. But that's why I build this way because it keeps me inspired and I just want to try to finish primarily 90% anyway each scene so I have something, right? Rather than yep. just sweeping across the whole layout, losing direction and, oh, what am I going to do here and there? And I wanted to solve each problem as I go and build on the confidence, right? Because we're always gaining confidence, like no matter who we are. Do you think that's a reason why uh, the Fremo concept has become so popular in the last you know, several years where, you know, because you can build like a, a two foot by four foot little diorama, 
you know, a, a domino or a Fremo section, and you could put one, two, three of those together and make a complete scene and then just focus on that section of whatever it is that you're building and then take that and connect it and create the larger layout with other Fremo people. Oh, and sure. Make the big yeah. thing. So, I mean, you're, oh, yeah. you're you think that's part of why that's come in vogue so much, especially like more of a club lay or a club club concept rather than a home layout concept? That's probably a subcategory of the sort of, uh, you know, lone wolf kind of sectional layout of your own at home. You can also do that too, but everybody wants to have their own little railroad. I think like a lot of people do, right? Like, like, um, Another thing is, too, is terminology. Like, that's a modular uh, concept yeah. that you're talking about, where right. they have a stand, you know, they have a standard where the tracks meet. But this, like, when you do a shelf layout, like, it's sections, so they're all custom, right? It's designed to save and take down and move. Like, like I could I could take this, this layout down quite quickly, right? Because I designed and built it that way. There's three bolts on each section and then wax paper between each seam. So any glue that's gotten in there like matte medium, it's going to pop. I know I've done yeah. it before. So you just give right. it up, right? I mean, I can refund this thing. It's not going anywhere, right? It's not. It's super light, but it's, it's, it's cleated to the wall. And you'll see there's no legs except for one. There's a two braces on the corner here and the whole upper valance shelving is, is cantilevered with cables. So there's no, like, like there's no supports, right? Is there? No. Like, like there's no supports yeah. here either. There's no, no supports underneath. It's all workbench. It's the laminated fascia that, that, that stiffened the whole thing. Like if you go back to vlog number two, I think on videos, you'll see exactly how I built it and why I did it. And you'll see a bar right here holding it up until all the fascia was glued and stapled in. And then I pulled the bar off and the, and it didn't move. It just like, I could climb up on top. Well, I do. Oh yeah. Just to go back on the question. Sorry. Uh, uh, the gentleman oh, yeah. asked about the height. Uh, the only caveat for me is, is, is to get up in here and work on it. And you have to use a stool. That's probably the only caveat for high, you know, bench work like this is, is, is reaching in, but th these are all like components that I can build off the bench, like a rough in the footprint and then pull them down and work on them. And then I just drop them in. So I don't have to be up busting my back and you know, lamenting, <laughs> right? Oh, my back. You know, um, I just have to go up and, you know, drop it in, basically. That's why, That's how I got around that, the grief of, you know, the older back. <laughs> Ergonomics, that, that's part that, that you have to build into it. So, so then these are some of the concepts then that you've employed that help you live with your layout, right? Oh, yeah. So, like I, yeah, yeah. And, you know, so, okay, so that sounds easy, right? Well, Boomer can yeah. say that, whatever. Anyone can do that. But, like, okay, so how do I put this, right? Like, go to SIG, like the SIG, like the, you know, the Givens Special and Brothers. Right? Like, really yeah. smart people, really mature, wise model railroaders that have put their time in. There's many in the NMRA. They know those guys. You can say what you want about anybody, but there's wisdom out there, and they'll always tell you, do you have a plan? Have you thought mm -hmm. it through? Have you counted the cost? Like uh, some of the questions that hobby shops don't tell you, right? Okay. <laughs> there's a, a video if I ever heard of one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? No kidding. <laughs> you want to hear a couple of them? Yeah, oh, let's sure. do it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so things they don't tell you about building model railroads, like when you go to the hobby shop. And we've all started there when we see a beautiful local, you buy it, you build a layout mm. around it, right? And then you realize, yeah. no, this isn't working. I want to build another one. And I want to learn more. And I want to, you know, I want to build a layout I can live with for a long time. Because if you're going to build a layout that you're going to be satisfied with and rewarded with, and you can share even with your friends, family, whatever, you got to be able to live with it, right? You know, right? I'm not going to read you all this, but I talked about it being, you know, building a model railroad is a little bit like a marriage, right? <laughs> if you love it, you still have to build the relationship, right? You know what yeah. I mean? You got to live with it, accept some things you don't like, forgive mistakes, take risks, risks, support it, overcome all the problems associated with it while growing your skill set. The bliss is in achieving all the former. 
there's so many times where you're going to be like, oh, no, right? But we all, everyone, like, I go through it. I don't, I don't, you know, make a video about it all the time. I tell a few bloopers, but I go through it, too. Like, right down there, I, I, yeah. I have anguish, too. Um, I was at the IPMS show, like you mentioned, and there was a guy, some guys I met there from California, really cool guys, right? And we had a riot because uh, we were there like, you know, eight hours. And I said to him, I said, hey, man, you still having fun? And he goes, this guy's a model aircraft builder, like really good. eh? He says, nope, it's total <laughs> anguish. <laughs> 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 you know, because right, like you know, I mean, how that sounds like a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. But yeah. I think that any uh, any model railroader like that's you know uh, built a few layouts, right? Uh, will tell you, you know, like maybe they don't want want you because they don't want to discourage you. But we all have to go through it, right? It's just part of the journey, right? right? Like it's just I go through it all the time. You know, it's like, but I, but I. I know the reward is worth it. Like it's worth it. Like the hobby's really worth it. It's got so many wonderful, you know, rewards in it and, and, you know, all the different aspects of, you know, research and on and on it goes. Right. But, oh yeah. So just those points quick, uh, things they don't tell you about building model railroads. It's a long-term hobby. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. We talked about that. Right. Uh, you probably have too many locomotives. <laughs> <laughs> right? Don't, don't, right? You know, come on. As the, I look up, as I look up at my inventory. The choppers right? are coming in. Oh, my Jeep 40, my four axles, right? You know, that I never use, right? I do need uh, that new Dash 9, <laughs> Boomer. You're right. I do need that yeah, 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 for I my know, layout yeah. set in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> do they relate to your railroad, right? Um, you will lose interest at some point. You will lose interest at some point. Um, you can probably rekindle it. I'd say, you know, that's a thing you learn too. And that comes with research, you know, like involving yourself in planning again, right? If you're really passionate about the railroad. Like I know a guy, he's the owner of a hobby shop and he just went to uh, Europe. He traveled all around. And I, he, he bought a Marklin, right? He said, I'm doing a European thing. I'm, I rode trains there. My wife, for a couple months, we traveled in Europe. He says, I got to build a European railroad, right? Yeah. Um, awesome. It's expensive. Right? Not at once. But if you total up all your receipts at the end of the day, Ooh, it, no. it's not the cheapest <laughs> hobby. But, which, so but what hobby is, right? So, so uh, Split Rock, he always says it's cheaper than a bass boat. Yeah, and maybe I don't. On the I bass don't boat. know. <laughs> Andy, Andy, you have firsthand knowledge on that. <laughs> it's, I mean, a good boat costs you sixty thousand dollars. I don't want to know how much I've spent on my railroad with the bench work, the wiring, the lighting, the locos, the rolling stock. And do you ever do you ever calculate you paying yourself for the time invested in building the stuff? You know what I mean? Because I mean, if you go and buy things, they're built by people, and that's part of the financial cost in that. So, do we as modelers factor in our own personal value as hobbyists in building it? You know, as part of yeah. the financial cost or burden or however you want to say it, whatever you want to say. Right. Right. Yeah. It's uh, the last one I wrote was the primary purpose of a model railroad is to exist. Then you give it purpose. That should be sort of involved in your planning. But I mean, if you're not going to build, like if you like, you can't sit there and plan like forever and do nothing. Right. Like you have to dive in at some point and, and then try to make something out of it. Uh, whether it's your first layout or your fifth one or whatever, like it'll come eventually. Yeah. And uh, I, once again, I, I just think that a smaller layout uh, is, is easier to manage and it can be huge. Like this layout feels, feels huge to me. Right. And it's only 26 feet long. Like, you know, so it, like, it depends what you put into it. You know, and the story involved, like I have a lot of influence of my youth and stories, like little stories that, 
you know, that I remember that I, you know, like you said, Mike, like, how do you pick that little thing or that scene or, well, I don't yeah. know. It might be like, it might be, you know, I was going down the tracks the other day, crossing dunk away. And I, you know, I saw a big pile of ties and I thought, geez, I remember that when I was a kid down there, I'm going to build a pile of ties. I'm going to model it just like that or sort of like that. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. I just focus in on that kind of that, you know, this, the, you know, the smaller scene and just put more love into it, I guess. And, 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 and feel some people love to just operate and that's fine. Like I've seen people just do like, you know, the plywood Pacific, but it's the, they're more interested in the prototypical track layout and that's great. Right. That's, you know, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. You know, they can pull in big unit trains and operate that way. Right. That's the beauty of the hobby though. Right. If you have the space, <laughs> I <Yeah. know. laughs> no, that's I mean, Andy, are... I mean, Andy, you have quite a bit of space, right? Yeah, I do. So i i have a I have a twenty. That's about a twenty four by forty eight uh, foot space that I'm building, but I'm I'm kind of following the approach that you outlined with the the reading from from Ian Rice, right? It's it's uh i'm building one section at a time so i do have a loop running around the basement and that's primarily just to keep my son engaged yeah. you know uh while while i'm building the rest of this but you know what you see behind me here this this scene is only about 14 12 to 14 inches deep um all around and about i don't know that looks awesome from here yeah, i wish i could yeah. get closer but yeah i'm getting i'm I'm getting oh, there. there. I yeah. mean, oh yeah. You know, you can see. So, you know, basically what we have going on, it's just a little. Um, this is a little storage track thing, and this leads off into Pine just River the, wood that product. That backdrop and, looks great, Andy. Did you paint those trees in there like that? Yeah, those are all painted by hand. So that's wow. Bob Ross, watching Bob Ross videos, right? And awesome. then, and then using uh, acrylics. So, yeah. It's a, uh, but like I said, it's, 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 you know, got a little, uh, like a bog set up here for a Tamarack bog. And then it's, uh, I've been working on this for a year now. So you can and live with it, eh? I absolutely love this. And, um, I kind of, you know, I don't mean to, you know, I, I kind of know what you're saying where some days I won't even run trains. I'll just come down here with my cup of coffee and I'll sit and I'll stare at the scene in front of me. And, like this tree, right? I accidentally busted the tip off of the the top of the tree up here, so I'm like, oh, that'd be a great thing for an eagle's nest to sit on, you know. So <laughs> nice. I made a mistake, and I and I wrote and I roached it, but um, yeah, we're gonna fix it. And you got to model a little eerie, and they're called eeries. Oh yeah, eagle's nest, yeah, yeah, with little twigs. Yeah. You got to sew them all together there and plant it up there and. <laughs> that's what i did a so, buddy there a 3d modeling uh 3d print and get you to do a family of eagles there and oh i could talk to bernard right yeah, from, bernard, uh, yeah. talk to bernard yeah. to do your family of eagles yeah but anyways it's uh it's coming along and this is what i've been focusing on for the last year now yeah nice so, yeah awesome so i've taken that approach even though i got a whole basement in front of me so yeah no, it's good. It's good stuff. So I do want to just take a, a quick break here. And I know you guys are like, oh, Andy, shut up and let Boomer talk. But, um, you know, <laughs> uh, if you guys are enjoying the show tonight, uh, make sure that you guys hit the like and subscribe button. If you haven't subscribed to the show, we have a lot of content like this out there um, every, uh, every two weeks. And then we're also doing some other video shorts and all that good stuff, too. So make sure that you're you're with us here um every every time we have a show so you can continue to see great um great content like this tonight we are gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more we'll have a a middle of the show break mike is gonna do a short line of the show um and then boomer is gonna step away for a couple minutes and then uh, we'll come back for questions and and uh, uh the 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 lightning round of questions for boomer and we can talk about a few more concepts about living with our layout so, um, I guess, I guess, uh, the question to get the chat rolling here is, um, do you have a layout and are you living with it or are you tearing it down? So let us know, 
um, what's going on. And, and if these, if these uh, tips and, and comments from Boomer are helping out. You know, one so, thing, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead. I, Boomer, one of the things that just talking about what Andy just got done asking for the out and the layout, and it just, just kind of popped in my head. You know, so many times, I think as modelers, we see like what you've done, what Tom Klamoski has done, Tom Johnson, mm-hmm. you know, guys yeah. like this, you know, um, uh, Mike Rose, you know, Mike Confort, yeah. all these guys. We see what these guys yeah. do. And then we go in our basement, so we take a look at our stuff, and we're sitting there going, yep, nope, never going to happen that way. I am just not that good to be able to pull that off. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. the next thing you know, is the whole thing gets scrapped and personally i've already done that i've done i've done that myself where i've looked at something and said nope i've got to tear this all out and start all over because i really botched this all up i this is such a better direction to go if i do it this way is that the right thing to do in your opinion or is it would it be better to continue down the path you're on and make the corrections or make the learning or what you've learned into what you have right now because starting over takes a lot yeah oh yeah it's uh i mean that's a that's a great question here let me okay so remember this (laughs) yep 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 yep. yes yep yes People should try this more often. Like, just take a small piece of wood, plywood, and just do a right of way. Just do it. Yeah. Just, you know what? Uh, just challenge yourself. Just do a right of way, and and at least you're going to get a nice little base to display your favorite, you know, locomotives from your collection on. And you never know what that might do. You might get confidence from that, and it can spring into a larger layout, like a shelf layout. Or whatever, or I mean, if you're already committed to a large, I don't know, because every situation is different, and I would have to see it and talk to the person and and try to glean how they really feel about it, right? But um, it's never too late to just relook at your layout. Uh, for me, I like to focus in, as you know, I've mentioned postage stamp scene, right? And I'm not doing nothing past the overpass. I have plans, but I'm not like putting a stake in the ground. A, 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 a tie in or spike in the rail until I can say, okay, I can walk away from this two sections for now. I can cycle back, right? One yep. step forward, two back. I mean, I haven't even done like the, like the, like I have, okay, so I should show, um, I don't know where it is now, but the tug, like somebody asked about the oh. tug. Remember the tug? Board? Right. Yep. Yeah. So, okay, it was a fair question, and I'll address it quick. So the tug is part of Section 1. So I've been on Section 2 here, as most people know, for months now, like all through the summer, right? So I'm not going to bounce back to the tug when I'm focused. Like, I finally got this all done, the slum ladder. That was my goal and my plan that I wrote down. Like, Andy, we talked about writing down our goals, right? Yeah, right. Like on Section 2 here, I said, okay, I wrote it down. I have the warehouse built and I want to move on. I want to go back to the tug, but no, I'm getting the slum landlord scene done so I can walk away and I feel closure and I feel, okay, I finally solved the block. And then I can cycle back and do the tug again. That's part of section one. There's the ferry, which I have down below. I cut the hull piece in the summer. It's all in motion, but it's all like there's a type of discipline, like structure, production structure that I have in place that I write down and I try to stick to, and it helps, right, a lot for me, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, so I'm structured too, right? I'm disciplined too. You know, I've heard people say, oh, you know, the model railroad should just be fun. You should just, well, it's not always fun. <laughs> you know, it just isn't, yes. right? Sometimes it's, it's work. Not. I mean, let's be honest. It's not always fun. Like, there is, a like, the beauty of a model railroad, especially with family, it's an incredible tool, like, to teach problem solving and then to get yes. the rewards from it, from solving the problem, right? And then you get to play, too, right? 
and you get to look and and exercise you know the creative spark that i think most every model railroader has even though they don't admit it you know that's another <laughs> topic for another show art and model railroading but yeah so it's it's a it's really hard to describe right like when you start to get a layout that starts to show a bit and starts to have you know some substance and color and operational possibilities it is very very cool <laughs> this guy four letter word work yeah yeah unfortunately we can't get away from that entirely right <laughs> yeah right <laughs> you know because a layout is work like ask tom and and you know like ask the toms right right you know was there work was it hard work right and they're not gonna i doubt they're gonna say oh no it was all bliss right <laughs> yeah. yeah it's all unicorns and rainbows <laughs> yeah unicorns and you know, rainbows i have a lot of respect for people that have built big layouts like there's a few out there i think uh there's bennett or excuse his name uh a fellow he's yes big, stephen oh, bennett yeah. yeah 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 i mean what a yeah. what a masterpiece that is right yep. and he's been at that for what what did he say 30 years yeah it's been a long time oh yeah you know, like I've been on this, this is my third year on this. And people say, hey, when are you going to, like they're joking around, but you know, uh, when are you going to get, yeah, Rob Bennett. Rob Bennett. Thank, thank you, you, Otter Creek. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah, so people joke around and go, oh, you know, you're not on section three yet, you know, or the tug's not done. Hey, man, it's like three years here. You know, I'm having fun, right? You know, I don't want to, I mean, I, I want to get stuff done. Trust me, but I want to have fun too, right? And uh, I want to put my vision in and however amount of time it takes so that I can live with my layout is the time it's yeah. going to take. <laughs> and I'm going to share it with all of you, <laughs> good or bad, right? So, yeah. yeah. And uh, besides the community, you know, like I love seeing everybody else's mm. too. Like I love, like I know this, shameless plug for you andy but the show is great i go back and i watch stuff like all the different layouts and and i learn stuff you know i really do yeah. you know uh people have different approaches they have a different style you know um it's it's great you know what a great time to be in the hobby really right yeah for sure yeah and it's 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 really amazing even just like uh going back through the the chat you know, and, and just, you know, sometimes half half the fun is reading the chat of a show, of course, but there's a lot of good, uh, you know, the community comes together and, and offers up a lot of good wisdom and insight that can help oh, yeah. out and help out guys like me. I mean, I've learned quite a bit just from, you know, keeping one eye on the show and then also on the chat. Uh, you know, we got a lot of good people in the community that are willing to help out. So, yeah. that's, and, you know, I guess the, the, the question is, is that, um, you know, you go back to you talking about, you know, lay, you know, living with your layout now. What were some of the decision points that you had to make on the other layouts that kind of said, I can't live with this anymore. I'm done. I got to move on. You know, like, so when, when did you throw in the towel on a certain layout? Okay, so that's a great question. And I have a good, like, uh, experience to maybe talk about that like when i went from glover road right yeah yeah to river to to river road so when i was getting to the end of glover road i was beginning to realize that okay when i started this i didn't really plan what i want to see and mm. right it was like started out as a track plan okay i want a siding and i want to uh run around and i just want to run locomotives paint locomotives paint stuff do some scenery do some buildings get get back into it again, right? Like a primer, like get, get the juices flowing, like get the skill set greased up, get it going again, right? Start learning new things, making mistakes, solving things, like getting back into the groove. And it was really good. And then after looking at it, I realized, you know, how far can I go with this? Because what I'm seeing now, what I really want to do now is expand on this. I either add on to it or I start again with a new, you know, with new bench work. Right. Like that was the big decision, you know, for me. But I knew that Glover Road had pretty much come to an end in terms of um, it was limiting me as to my vision and how I wanted to build out, you know, the scene, um, you know, that I had planned 
with S or Y all <laughs> along because actually it was just drop S or Y locomotives on Glover Road and it's S or Y. It it didn't like there was nothing prototypical really about Glover Road, but it was fun though. It was an awesome build. I learned so much and it didn't matter, right? But because I had so much uh, research and experience around, you know, BC Hydro Rail and SRY, I wanted to take a whole, I wanted to start from scratch again and uh, yeah. take, take what I had learned and what I've read and what I've been inspired by other modelers and so on. I just, it just all started to kind of come to a maturing process. Like, you know, like in my kind of philosophy and how I was starting to view how I wanted to, you know, build it. Like, I think that's part of the whole thing that everybody goes through. You can't really describe, like, you know, what it is to be successful <laughs> with it, right? You just, <laughs> you just got to just keep plugging at it, right? And it'll come. Something will come good out of it, right? And uh, I just feel so great about River Road. I, I just uh, call it magical, call it whatever it is. But I have to attribute it to all the reading I've done of the masters that have come before me. Mm. And really, right? Like, uh, I will say, like, I am quite well read on the hobby, right? Like, I right. read a lot of books on modelers, model railroaders. And I probably need to, like, if I need to learn anything more, like, I should read up on is operations. But I can talk mm. to Mike about that. <laughs> You have you have resources at the disposal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because sure. yeah, because you know, like the term operations, like I have a plan, you know, for River Road. Like I've been thinking that through. I don't know, like I'm not well versed in it, but I think I'm on the right track, and I think my uh, plan, my track plan, is going to accommodate um, satisfying operations. But I'm not really going to be operating or, or enter into the operational phase until it's done, until it's <laughs> like. Section three is done. And then I'm going to start enjoying that part. And then I'm going to start dropping 50 gallon drums, more barbed wire fence, other details, painting cars, weathering mm. locomotives, you know, uh, like there's so much more, right? Like another chapter that I already know that I can live with because that's there. Right. Right. You know? Like it's part of the plan. And, and I'll say it again. It's the size. It's the size of this layout that I don't, like I go to bed at night. I never, like, I don't have one shred of anxiety, <clears throat> excuse me, over this layout. I don't go to bed or I don't think, oh, geez, where am I going with this? Or, you know, it's too big or whatever, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that's why I, I kind of push the shelf layout because I think it can help people overcome, you know, like maybe that particular struggle they're having right yeah i mean it just it's it's fun to watch your your videos and even like talking tonight and the enthusiasm that you have for the build you know that that you're you're doing right now and it's you can see that's not waning at all right you're 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 no in this it's room. not yeah, no. and you know, you may have a little lull here and there when you're trying to figure out yeah. the, the the one scene, but you know, it it's it seems like that that enthusiasm's renewed, and it's it's all it's all engines on go here for you. It's really and and having a a small focused footprint probably has a lot to do with that. I'm gonna guess for me it does. Yeah, right. It might not be that way for somebody else, like. Like, uh, uh, you know, the young fellow there, he's very talented. You know, he's doing the big B and SF. You, you did a show with him. Oh, Cam. I'm sorry. What's his oh, name? Cam, Please forgive uh, me. Um, sorry. Uh, Cam, Cam Neely. Yeah. Yeah. Cam Neely. Yeah. So, you know, player. he has a, no, like his no dad, not the hockey player. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, his dad was into it. Right. And, uh, helped him out. Right. And got him going and he's got the space there and he's just, you know, he's really nailing the class one railroad, isn't he? Yeah. He's oh, yeah. right. <laughs> and he probably, uh, can live with it. I think like, it looks to me like he can, right. You can, you, you can, can see his can enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. Right. You can see yeah. his enthusiasm and you can just kind of tell when people talk about their railroads too. It's, 
it's, you know, there are people like, you know, like you who are very energetic about it and, you know, there's work involved, but, you know, obviously it doesn't seem like work. And then there's the other where it's, uh, it almost seems like, uh, yeah, I got to lay out and, you know, there's, it's just, you can just tell. Well, enthusiasm yeah, we've all been there, Andy. Like you just described yeah. it perfectly, Andy. Like I know that emotion. I know exactly yeah. that emotion. I had it. Like I built a big end scale layout uh, about ten years ago, like uh, where I lived before I moved out here with my wife and I to <laughs> Fort Langley. We moved from Walnut Grove, like more west towards Vancouver. We moved out more towards Fort Langley about twelve years ago, and I had a garage, right? A really large garage, and I started an end scale for the. Oh, what's that, Ron? Street? Yeah, he says. Yeah, balance to... is the key. Yeah, and and that's different for different people, right? Like that, like it's a process, and everybody's in this process. And if you can live within that process, and 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 still maintain the passion for the vision for what you see for your model railroad, then you're on the right track, right? right. Like I was building an end scale, uh, like the sub of uh, Kicking Horse Pass from Field all the way up to. Um, well, that was the problem, all the way up to um, right. Oh. <laughs> it was an end, it was an end scale layout. It was built like this. I I done the upper valance, the bench, and uh, I had all the cars. I was handling all the turnouts. Was doing the uh, run out of field, compressing, designing, and I didn't really have a good plan. And I got into it for about I don't know a couple of years, and I just bailed on it. Just locked, mm. like I couldn't live with it. Yeah, I was going to bed at night and I thought, oh, geez, this is not, you know, like I don't have an endpoint here. I don't have a plan. I don't, you know, right. And uh, that was end scale. Like I had a big collection of end scale stuff. I sold it all, but I, I like the Cato and Cato, you know, and even the Atlas stuff. And, you know, I had all the Canadian Pacific liveries. I had the cars mm. and, and uh, I think it was on code. It was code 55 and code 40 rail, you know, looked good too, wow. but, uh, never, I, I just ran out of gas, tore yeah. it all down. I just took the saws all through it. Ugh. You know, I didn't even think of designing sectional either, which was wrong for me now. Uh, like I know that if I had to move, like this is going with me, like yeah, e easy, easy to move. No, no saws all. Ever will touch any of my layouts ever again. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> Never again. No sawzalls. <laughs> but if you have to take the sawzall, do it with joy. Because when you get it past you, when you get past it, you'll feel relief, right? Then you can start again. Yeah. Fresh. <laughs> and it's okay to start again if you need to, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You will learn, like you'll carry all that with you and you'll just feel it'll feel like a new like it's just a fresh start right and uh i think people i think it's it's easy to neglect research i think that's yeah. one of the ones you know that i neglected even though i thought i was pretty good at researching but with this uh river road i have a lot of research involved and a lot of passion and i think a lot of the passion comes from the prototype research like when i go down to like when I see these units working, I, I just get re-inspired. Uh, I just pushed up another notch when I'm kind of down maybe and flatlining a bit. Uh, when I, I just go out and I catch a, a local on that and it's like I smell the diesel, I, sm I hear the air spitting and I just, you know, the track squealing and, you know, the guy's working the conductor and it's like, oh man, I got to go back and start that, finish that scene, right? You know, run the run a car, one car. Like on this railroad, you'll see MU units with one box car a lot. Really? That's a lot of oh, power. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. They don't mess around like they don't get caught with their pants down. Right. They've always <laughs> got dual power, like the road power. Because you never know. Like uh, they might be up the valley, like up near my place. There's a uh, grain elevator further up where they drop a couple of cars. I, I'm not sure how many on a given day. And they come in there and they do their thing and they drop, you know, pull the empties, drop deuce, and then run all the way down, you know, with two road units, right? Nope. But mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. <laughs>
research helps, you know, like, so prototype influence is important uh, for some people, right? Yeah. Um, if you don't, like with Glover Road, there was no real, it was a bunch of feelings and cool ideas I just started to do. And then I ran out of gas with it, kind of. Uh, it, uh, you know, I couldn't really, I mean, I love it. Like I still have it. I kept it all. I really think it's cool, but it's really more of a whimsical layout, right? This is more proto freelance. I know that term gets thrown around, you know, a bit of a uh, cliche, but yeah, what's that? Their prototype and rail fanning helps you get through the downtimes and more oh, yeah. the model. Thumbs up to Tom. He, he, yeah. He knows that, see? And and you can't apologize for that because he's right about that. And I bet you he knows 10 people, at least, that would say the same thing, right? Sometimes yeah. you just got to go out and take pictures of trains or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to clear your head, you know? Yeah. And once I in mean, a while, you might see something that will inspire you to get over the hump, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, Mike, you know, you're an engineer for CN and you're talking like that. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> like looking out the window. Oh, look at that. That's inspiring to do a motor railroad and you're notching, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Up, right. Yeah. I sit there. I sit there. I'll be at work every once in a while. I'll be like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then all of a sudden I, I carry this little small pocket camera with me and I'll snap a few pictures of it. And, and then I'll, keep forgetting to put it on my computer so I can reference it again but because <laughs> it's up in my lunchbox but but the thing is it's like you know when you do things like that or like I might see a car of a, a box car come in I'm like oh that's a really cool looking box car and I know it's got graffiti all over it but I know what that I know by doing research I know what that car was tw looked like 20 years ago so wow. I can go by, I can go back because it still says, you know, Porta Galveston on it. As a matter of fact, we just, we just spotted one of those cars today, a Porta wow. Galveston double door box car. It, one side is actually patched out. The other side still has the bird on the side of it. So wow. it's like, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where these things are still floating around and it kind of inspires you to kind of get, go and do a little bit of checking on that, you know, and, I'm not above, you know, I mean, I have the ability to do it, but I mean, and I do not condone anybody doing this, but because I work for the railroad, I have to check the, you know, the brakes once in a while. And so <laughs> once my conductor, I have to go and make sure things are right. So when my conductor's in eating lunch, he, I'll, I'll be like, I'll be right back. He goes, where are you going? And I'm really like, well, I'm going to go look at this one car and I'll go in there and I'll look underneath because the railroads used to paint on the center still this the the reporting mark and the road number and a lot of railroads nowadays never bothered to paint over any of that so if you find the right car that original number and road and, and initials are on that car from when it was originally built hmm. so you can it might have four layers of paint on it but the original car number is on the car somewhere not always and it's getting harder and harder to find that. But every once in a while, I see a car and I'll be, yep, I got to go check that one out. Especially old Green Bay and Western stuff that comes in. Because I see those every once in a while. Yeah, mm, so interesting. Uh, my lawyer is telling me right now the second section podcast is not, not yeah. liable <laughs> for any rummaging around the underside of rail cars. Nope, they do not do it. may or may not have heard on this show this evening. Do not do it. Don't do that. Don't do it. That's it's it's not a good idea and it's and it's trespassing so i mean i i get yeah. to do it because i work there so that's about the only thing but so so you have a so let's can we talk about the thing you were just fiddling there with boomer oh okay yeah. all right yeah so, so this, this was, is this was brought up earlier yeah this is a uh, long hood from um uh 902 i think one of the sw 900 rs's uh that was a proto 2000 um it was a project that i was working on some time ago and i've you know i got shelved right yeah. and then and, and then i decided to update the livery so they're 
you know, uh, this is 2012, right? Nice. The Washington, the Washington logo here. Yep. yep. Because that's kind of the period that this is around, you know, 2012 ish. And then, yep. you know, uh, we were talking about this, you know, the one before that was a little bit of an interim one and it wasn't very like one of my favorites. And then the, the next two switches that I want to do and the SD 35 that Andy so dearly dedicated to me, right. Which is <laughs> down, down here, which I'll show you. <laughs> I just stripped that. What was it called? Andy, the Mascutan Valley. Yeah, it used to be Mascutan uh, Valley. Yep. So this is an SD35 in Atlas. One of the older ones with the Cato Drive. Yep. Um, and uh, I love the Atlas Cato Drives. <laughs> so do way. I. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, I wanted to ask fire. you, Andy, what kind of paint did you put on this? Because I had a real tough time getting the paint off of this locomotive, man. <laughs> like, um, that... I, with, <laughs> Yeah, with IPA, I was using 99%, and it just was so stubborn. I had it in there for two weeks. So that and, uh, I used, um, that was Badger that I shot on oh, that. Oh, the Badger paint. I figured yeah. so, right? That stuff yeah. does not so, like IPA, yeah. Yeah, so that was that was Badger, and I think I even did an undercoat of Steinle, uh res on that as well. Oh, so. okay. Oh jeez! Yeah, yeah so, uh, I, this one, I did not yeah. mess around. <laughs> Holy cow! I, so Andy, I guess not. <laughs> yeah. So Andy Crawford, like I don't know if he's still watching, but uh, he'll appreciate this. Like this is what's going into this, right? So there's a thin wall cab, <laughs> right? Or no, that's the oh yes, yeah, the short hood kit and uh, EMD fuel tank set. And fans, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the Canon company. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar, this is like as good as it gets for injection molded plastic uh, detail parts for, for building up, you know, long and short hoods, cabs, et cetera. Wow. Yeah, yeah the thin wall cab is nice because when you open the doors and you look at the windows, is like the, you know, they're thin, right? Yep. Scale, the scale thinness or whatever. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the one. Uh, you know, and I talked about, um, I, I, I was frustrated, right? Like when I was in the finishing off the slum landlord flats, which I'm kind of like, that kind of ends, like I'm going to go back, like I'm trying to get more into doing this now for a bit, even though this, there's a short series here. And then I want to revisit the, I want to finish the tugboat off it. I don't have a whole lot to do. I want to plow through that, get that done for the barge slip over there. And, uh, you know, just try to get some work done on some cars and stuff, which I haven't touched for a while, but I really want to get this done. And then I have the two switchers. Somebody asked about those. When are you going to do those two repeatos, right? Well, they're right there Look at, <laughs> looking at me, right? But the clock, you know, Andy, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. There's not enough yep. hours in the day, right? And I'm fairly disciplined and structured. And I just, I'm trying, like, it's on the production queue, but the production queue just doesn't move, right? I have to move. <laughs> so, um, but uh, this is going to have the meatball, right? The meatball livery. Yes. Yeah, because right after 2012, they had both, right? Yeah. Uh, they had uh, both um, liveries. They had that one and then the meatball that actually ran together for a short mm. period. So, and then, of course, I grew up around this one, uh, the BC Hydro. So and the, it was, and the sorry and the cab had the quasar kind of yeah. So a question that was earlier in the chat um, was: Would you ever do a retro session with BC Hydro? Oh sure, because uh, yeah, because scale trains like uh, uh, the guys that are that have that new hobby shop that. Actually, it's a train shop. It's not yeah. trains, but the, the nicest train shop I've ever seen. And I've know a lot of hobby shops. Yeah, I grew, I, up, you know, I, I grew up around them, right? So <laughs> yeah. these guys really are doing doing it right. So um, and their web page is going to spring soon, and you know we'll probably talk about that. But um, 
they have a, scale, a pending scale trains order, right? That was grandfathered in. I get, I can't get into all the details because I know they're they have a different sort of approach to online that they, and that's their decision, right? But they do have some grandfathered in dealers still and orders, mm -hmm. like pre-orders. Yeah. And uh, I was told that SD 38s coming in this livery. DC Ooh. Hydro units are coming. So Ooh. you think I'm going to just look at them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and say, no, you're nice. coming no, home thanks. with me. Because <laughs> I don't have any scale trains yet, right? If he goes, oh, uh, scale trains. Yeah, well, you know, I love my Atlas and Cato and my Proto, right? Yeah. But I'm open to scale trains. They're nice. They look nice. I don't know how they run. I don't know how they, they run. To, you know, I have so. a lot of them. They all run really well. Okay. I'll take your word for it. That's good enough. Yeah. I'm sold, right? I don't have uh, any. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't make them an S-scale, Mike. Not yet. Not, <laughs> Not yet. yet. Not yet. They okay. do they, they right, do have yeah. they do have the S helper services stuff. So maybe yeah. another SW twelve hundred will be in my future. And you got some box cars, right? Some forty yep, foot I got <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got a bunch of brand spanking new forty foot box cars, yep. But uh, this SD35, uh, I really want to do because I want to uh, MU this uh, with uh, the 381 or 382, like the SD38s, right? Like these here. Yeah. They run together now. Like they do a lot of the road switching uh, at Ipex Plastics because they're heavy plastic hopper cars. They're heavy. So... Mm -hmm. um, uh, they link up those, and uh, this SD35 has dynamic. It's the only dynamic brake unit that they have, other than some of the Jeep nines, and it's turbocharged. Mm. Yep. So, but I got some cool footage in one of my the Slum Landlord inserts where it's I'm up close. You can hear that whining up, and it's yanking on the cars, and kunk, 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 you know how they are, right? Yeah. You know, when they you know, when they pull them off the you know, when they're sitting there fully so loaded. So a, a question that ties to that from the section crew here from Chris Bell is, so how how long of a train do you plan to run? Okay, so that's a good question. So the, um, I wanted to explain that. Uh, does uh, is a Mike doing the uh, short line show soon or? Yeah, we can we can take a break for short line and then come back into the operations piece. Yeah, okay, um, here. sure. And we'll answer that question if you could bring it up again, because I was going to mention about that because it's a good question on a smaller layout, like what kind of length of how long a train do you plan to run? Yeah. And then we'll uh deal with that question when I get back because I want to explain how I'm going to deal with that. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. So we'll take and our I can, uh, I can go make another coffee and there uh, you go. Oh, and uh Dennis had mentioned about the diner. I know there's people at the diner. Um, I'll have a little bit of su surprise, but I can do that uh when I'm off. off we'll take right. you off camera. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. We'll bring yeah. you back on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, so for gonna... 15 minutes or so, because I'll be watching it too, and I've been on a couple monitors, but yeah, I'll yeah right would... around in there. Maybe yeah. not even this one's a kind of a 15 short minutes. One. This one's kind of a short one, so yeah. I'll, oh, drag, it it I'll drag it yeah. over. Okay, I'll get cracking then, and then uh, we'll come back <laughs> and we'll and uh, we'll address that uh, question by Chris Bell. Yeah, yeah. that sounds good. Yeah. All right, yeah. so we'll okay. kick it over to the Greasy Meat Hands band here, and I'll cue up the bumper. Mike, you ready to roll? Yes. All right, sounds good. Thank you, and here we go. All right, it is time for the short line of the show. Mike? I'm going to take that down. Oh, there we go. Yeah, what state are we in? Well, first of all, I found it. You I found the presentation. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. It just, I was in a panic, and I, because I have all the material to do the short line of the show, and then all of a sudden, I go to do the presentation and there's no presentation. I'm like, uh oh. Oh no. Yeah, that's what I We're said. In trouble now. That's why if it looked like I was kind of preoccupied and not in a very good mood early in the show, that's why. Because I'm like trying to find all this stuff to do it. And then all of a sudden I just stumbled on it. I'm like, well, how the hell did this get here? So <laughs> anyway. Okay, so 
We are in the state of Montana. And Ooh. yeah. And let me tell you, Montana is and I haven't been to Montana for years. Uh ever since mm. oh man, I mean ever since I was a kid, really. Yes. But it is it is gorgeous out there. I mean, there isn't a part of that state that's not beautiful. Uh, whether you're on the you know the prairie the land of prairie the east, or, yep. yeah, prairie land of the east, and 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 or or out in the mountains. It, I mean, it's just it, it's just a beautiful. It, there, you could see why they call it the Big Sky State, right? I mean, it's in yes. Big Sky Country. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. Unless you want to model the BNSF. <laughs> 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 there isn't a whole lot of anything else out there. There are there's a handful of short lines, okay? Sure. Uh the real interesting ones are pretty much sucked up by the, you know, either the Orange Borg or you know, Watco or whatever. The conglomerates, right? The conglomerates, right? And then there's a handful of, of like a very small handful that at one time were doing stuff but because of geopolitical issues with BNSF, they're basically nothing more than a car storage railroad right now. Okay. So <clears throat> that was my first goal. one, And then I'm like looking around and I s literally stumbled on the railroad for the short line of the show. All right. Okay, here we go. We're gonna do this and uh, do our okay, do my here's this. Do the normal shimmy here. We're gonna do the yep. normal the, share my screen shimmy. Yep, yep, yep. And it's gonna go here, and we're gonna do this, and there we are. The port of Montana. Dun dun dun. Yeah. Yeah, one the, probably one of the most landlocked states there is. But Next to Kansas and Nebraska, yeah, right? Some of these other, anyway. Port of Montana, um, it's really kind of an interesting little deal. Um, it's in the it's right near Butte in the town of Silver Bowl. Um, it's been around for well over 30 years. The whole railroad is a mile and a half long. Do you remember the, what was it called in California? We did California, the Quincy Railroad. Yeah, a teeny tiny one there. A teeny tiny one. It went from that UP interchange to like a lumber mill and back, right? Right. And so this is a very similar situation, except for it's got a ton of stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> it sits right between... The Union Pacific Main Line, which can you see my cursor right here? Can you I see can, my yes. Okay. Yes. So this right here is the Union Pacific. Okay. And this up here, uh actually the BNSF kind of runs over here someplace. And uh, there's a photo where you can see, I, I believe you can see them both at the in the photo at the same time. But it's basically a a transload facility and for the city of for the city of Butte from what I've been able to do research on um they they have they unload auto racks okay a mile, a mile and a half long railroad and they unload auto racks you can see right here this is the marshalling and, and I I've always known it as being called a marshalling facility wherever they unload auto racks. That's okay. That's the terminology I've always grew up with. Um, they have this nice warehouse right here. Yeah. Um, they unload lumber right here. They also do like, uh, like I want to say it's like a soda ash type of unloading over in this area. They also do some tank car unloading right back over in here and up and around this loop right in here. They do some, uh, look, from what I gather, not often, but some aggregate stuff also. So it's really, really kind of neat. Uh, 
There's a question here before we get too far down the line, pun intended. Yeah. Uh, Chris Chris Holschbach uh, is asking, is this a branch off the Milwaukee? No, not that I know of. No. no. The one that I was thinking of doing was like the, the line that went to Lewiston and over the Silver Creek trestle yeah. and everything like that. And it that was that's that was a line off the Milwaukee. But from what I understand is this is just a railroad. This is just I'm not sure where the UP and the BNSF. I'm not sure what the history on these lines are at Silver Bowl. They may be from the Milwaukee Road, one of them. But I didn't look that deep into it. I'm sorry, but I, I I really honestly didn't. I was just so entranced with how this thing was set up. So um <laughs> Ron uh, Clay says it sounds like a team track on steroids. It is a giant team track on steroids. Well, <laughs> this picture that we have right here, yeah, you can see the entire railroad. It Woo. makes a, it makes a horseshoe. It goes by the Solvay USA facility, which is the track is actually right in here. Okay. Okay. Up and around, and here you have the transload area. Down along this portion right here, down down this section to the schoolyard grain elevator, which has its own switch engine. Cool. Yeah. But now they've actually started to develop this area. And in, between, in the middle of the horseshoe. In, in the middle of the horseshoe, they started developing this. Yeah. And when I started, and I'll show this a little later, I actually came up with a track plan to try to show how you could actually model this on a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood. Really? Yeah. So uh, it's, it may not be the best track plan, but okay. when, you, when you see the whole thing and the way it's all set up here, it, you'll kind of understand it a little bit more. Okay. Okay, here's school your grain. And if you look right down here, there's a little a little facility here. I'm not couldn't get a real good look at it, um, except for through this. And it, it looks as if this may be for un unloading of some kind of product. Here, right here, this little black dot right here, that's the switch engine. I got a picture of that. Ooh, okay. And then they have a little four-track yard right here. So it's a fairly oh. It's a fairly respectable size grain facility. And then this is a connection right here with the main line. And this very well may be the U Union Pacific's main. Mm. But it, it, it's uh, but I'm under the um, uh, the impression that that uh, the Port of Montana actually comes and helps service this. So, but if no anybody knows better, let me know because I would I would gladly know or like to know that. So here is a map that I took from I'm gonna I'm gonna show you this book. Can you see can you see this right here now or do it did I go to a different window? You must have went to a different window, Mike. Okay. So I won't show it. It's from a book uh called uh MT Connections. Uh let's see what's the name of this thing. Oop, sorry about that. Hey. Whoa, hey, there we are. Are we there? We're, no, I have uh, MT Connection Rail Park overall site layout. MT Connections full outside outside layout. Okay, hold on. A minute. Mon Montana Connection Rail Park over set overall site layout. Yep, that's what Re I was. That was hoping. Reading oh, is hard. Yeah, reading is hard. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to do is get the name of this where I got this from. Uh, it's the Montana Connections Rail Rail and Road Expansion Project um, and Grant Program, specifically oh. for, by uh, uh, by the City and County of Butte Silver Bowl and the Port of Montana Railroad. The, so this was an expansion project that they put in play, which has built another yard here and several like little wing tracks. To go in and serve these other uh, facilities, you have Western States right in here. You have Montana Craft Malt in this area. Wow. Uh, 
Solve parcels is this is more uh, Solve properties, and this is all part of I. Uh, what you see in green and blue here, I believe has been built and the stuff in purple is either in the process of being built or proposed to be built. So this is a little bit of an expanding railroad right now, you know? Yeah. And then you can see over here, the red, the red is um, the uh, uh, Port of Montana's tracks. And then the yellow here is, uh, from what I understand, is the um, the Union Pacific. And then they, if you can see over here in green, they also have some expansion for some more of the transload facilities uh, to expand trackage. In the tr so there's a lot going on with this. Nice stars. Right. It really is. <laughs> and it's only a mile and a half long. So just imagine, this is really condensed. Mm-hmm. Okay, they've got one one locomotive. Ooh, that's this pretty. Is, isn't that kind of cool? Kind of gives you like that Illinois terminal vibe, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So it's uh it's a GP thirty eight AC. Yeah. Um, it was originally built in nineteen seventy for the Illinois Central as a ninety five nineteen. It it's been around. It's been on the MKT as it's three four or three forty three. It's been the 1999 on the Union Pacific, and this is actually an NREX um, uh, locomotive. They just don't have the reporting marks on it, and uh, but they're they basically own it, I guess, from what I understand. But the Port of Montana, still, the Port of Montana owns it, but I guess they still find it under NREX 3641. This is it, beautiful. I mean, uh, this is a really pretty locomotive. I mean, it's a what well, we got a GP thirty eight AC. Yep, which and it's is a, basically a thirty eight dash two. You know, or a, or or well, it's a GP thirty eight, but it's got AC guts to it. So instead of being DC, it's AC. So and then apparently they decided to put a door with a window on it. <laughs> gotta like, have one of those yeah like a 38-2 has but some of the things here i mean here's some tank cars back here look at a look, look at a photo backdrop you could end up doing oh uh, right this. and it, it's just beautiful i mean i you know sometimes we talk about taking a look at beyond what's on the photograph obviously the the locomotive is the primary the primary focus but beyond the photo you just start looking at the the rolling hills and the and the and the tank cars and and how all the scenery is just this brown you know this brownish color right. you know it's just beautiful so uh let's see here if i do this okay ah. yeah so scolier grain has a illinois central Paducah Rebuild SW13, number 1309. And these are the photos that I was able to find of it. This is a, all two of them. All two of them. Yep. <laughs> but it's kind of neat because this one, this one, especially because you kind of can see how their, their, uh, their facility is set up. You know, their loading facility is all set up. So it's kind of neat. But uh, this one, again, this engine was built in 1950, and it's, what, 73 years old, still providing service? That's awesome. That's, wow. you know, th thanks to rebuilding. I mean, that's, they really know how to build things way back in the day, right? Uh, built to last. So, yep. So, now, this, if you if you look, well, matter of fact, here's a really good look at, at the at the grain elevator facility itself, the loading facility. You can see how that spout comes down right over the top of the track, and yeah. so I mean, and then you have the truck dock right over here. So you could really do this on a shelf layout too, if you really wanted to, like around yeah. the room, like a like a room the size Boomer's got. You could do that in in, in HO on this. Yeah, and that's a great, great structure to scratch build, too. Now, the one thing that I'm not sure on is what these two boxes are. And this little horn right here, and I'm assuming that this is for remote control. 
because all the cables look like they tie in up underneath the 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 uh, the edge of the the front drawbar, and it just it, this is kind of weird looking, but I and it looks it has an antenna on it. So I'm assuming that this is for remote control service or some kind of remote service. But how cool would how cool of a little detail would that be to try to, you know, string all this all these cables up and just kind of glue them up underneath here, you know, drive yourself insane. <laughs> be a cool model to attempt. That's oh, sure. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, here's uh, here's another photo of the. Uh, the Port of Montana GP38AC, uh, you know, dragging a little cut of uh, of auto racks here. And then here you got some more tank cars in the background. And mm -hmm. if you look off to the right, you can see, look at all the tracks here. There's just a plethora of tracks. I've been wanting to use that word for a while. <laughs> Did you recently watch Three Amigos? No, but I, no, I haven't. But, <laughs> but no. <laughs> This is a plethora. It's a plethora. <laughs> so it, but this is a, this gives you a little bit of a look as to what the, the, the little yellow Chevron on the front here is. Yeah. It's a nice three quarter shot angle of the, yeah, it is. Locomotive. Non dynamic 38 AC. Yeah. And you know what? Every time I look at this locomotive, not to sound belittling or anything, but this engine just screams a beginner project to me. It just really does. It just screams. It's a single color with a single stripe. Uh, you know, a sing there's nothing really fancy about the paint scheme that would really lend itself to a lot of, like, uh, nerves, really. It, it fairly straightforward masking. Um if I had to yeah. take a guess, if I had to take a guess, I would say that this is probably close to, um, maybe between uh, probably close to twenty four inches for a stripe width, eighteen to twenty four inches in width. Um, it, it's just it just really screams a, a good starting attempt for somebody who wants to try you know airbrushing for the first time or oh, custom. Yeah first time it's just a simple project so uh let's see here's another picture of it now here's another thing you got this thing this this railroad sits right between two interstate highways interstate 15 and i-90 so you can access this from two different interstates which is kind of cool too so i mean it's very accessible so, uh, some more here. You can see some lumber background, and then check out that for a for a uh, photo backdrop. How do you like to have oh, that? Man. You know the what I mean. Hills in the background there. Yeah, hills in the background. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, Boomer was just talking about you know putting up barbed wire and everything. Check out the fence with the yeah. little. With the, with the barbed wire and the gate, the the gate with the barbed wire and everything like that around it, that's kind of neat. Uh, oh, gonna... Yeah, something oh, happened. <laughs> Some, something happened to this. But if you look, this was on this was on twenty eleven. This is twenty thirteen. So whatever happened, it's the other side though. It's the opposite side. But you can assume that it's like that on the earth because you look at the nose, the nose is even all, uh, you know, this is a lot, this is much shinier. This looks shiny. So, the, the whereas the pilot doesn't look as, as shiny. So, whatever happened here, um, it, it let go full of a lot of oil. But hey, how cool of a weathering project is that? Yeah, right. That's kind of slick, right? And look at the lettering on the side of the locomotive. It's not straight. No, no, it's kind of got a little arch arc to it, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's another thing too. So if you're a great beginner project, put a little hump in the in the lettering there. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> this is what happens when Ralph Ralph Renzetti gets a hold of your prototype locomotive. At this? <laughs> yeah. That's that's got the mud father written all over it. Absolutely. Uh <laughs> Here it is. Uh, here it is over there at that. Uh, I believe it's a soda ash uh, facility. Sure. Um, let's just call it that. But look at all the brand new trucks, all brand new Chevys sitting here, uh, and a bunch of lumber. The other thing is too is all the all the the uh, these look like landscape timbers to me. If you ask me, like not the not the full length ones, but the little. Itty bitty ones that you would use to go around like the front of your house for a flower bed. Garden, yeah. Yeah, like, it looks almost as if the it looks almost as if there's a cut right here, so it might be piled up or whatever. But just a cool. I thought this was kind of a neat scene. Uh, and then they're, oh, they must be doing something inside with that tank car over here too, because the door is open and there's a tank car right there. So, and here they got some guns, uh, some covered guns. And uh, now here you're looking away from, here's another thing. You're looking away from the mountainside and you're out in the middle of that's nothingness, unless that's a real a different sky. Unless this is a real distant mountain right here, you know, yeah, it looks that's like a, it, but... but that's a lot of sky, right? And then, but here again, look at all of the yard tracks that are right here. It's just yeah. incredible. And this is a little better better view of the whole thing. Here's a BNSF train coming coming through on the, on the back side, uh, and then the UPs over on this side. Uh, and here they're switching a bunch of uh, auto racks. You can see here they got the gondolas and everything like that. And yeah, and that looks cars. like a real life eighteen inch radius there. So, where's that? <laughs> which one? Just, which one is right here? here? Yeah, with the <laughs> string of with the string of auto racks. I mean, it looks like. Looks like something you see on a four by eight with a nice, you know, eighty nine foot cars navigate in the eighteen inch corner here. Oh they're, yeah, they're coming around tight. Yeah, and it that's one of the things that I kind of like was thinking about, and, and it, you know, not every railroad is going to have thirty four inch radius curves, right? So, and not everybody can afford that kind of room, and we've talked about that kind of stuff earlier tonight a little bit. Right. So that's why I came up with this for a track plan. Nice. So I, I used the Union Pacific as the interchange partner on this. I mean, you could make it UP, BNSF. You could make it either one, whatever floats your boat. But the way I designed this was if we go back and just indulge me for a moment, I'm going to go all the way back to the overhead photo. We're going to we're going from here down to here. So from the from the from the transload facility down to Scolier Grain. And if you really look at the way this is all set up, it's unidirectional. So in order to get down here, they would have to shove into the yard and then pull back and shove back up here. And in the same with the Port of Montana, everything would be a shove from this way. Okay, so when I came to go and design the layout, I thought, well, the the warehouse the warehouse area would be a good spot to rest the locomotive, either that or by the interchange or someplace in this on a switch or whatever. And you could go and you could do auto tracks on one track, the tanks and the covered hoppers, one or two on here, maybe one or two auto racks here. A center beam flat car for lumber, a warehouse, all this stuff could be, you know, operations done off of the UP interchange. Just set out over here and pick up and do what you need to, and then make a little bit of length of run around the corner, and you have a, a view block here. So you separate the two, you separate the two halves of the layout, and then you come over here and one or two cars. Uh, this would be enough to hold, I think, three car lengths, and then one wow. or two cars, one or two car lengths worth of grain, and you just design your grain ele elevator here, and then you just shove, you shove back and do your thing and tie up. So 
very simple kind of horseshoe concept, just very similar to the way the whole railroad is. And you can get started on a four by eight sheet of plywood. And you can get started on a four by eight sheet of plywood with, with what is it? Uh, four turnouts total. Um, so, and yet I believe it's two left-hand turnouts and two rights. And if I remember right, these are number fives. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it's nothing overly huge and nothing overly difficult. Um, but something that could get you started and kind of start getting those juices flowing. You know what I mean? Is that is that uh, HO scale, Mike? Yes, this would be for HO scale, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yep. So um, because, I mean, I, I did it in HO because I – Felt as if the uh, like you could. I think I think you could really easily represent the railroad in HO. Um, N scale, I think you would get a little bit. It would be a little harder actually, even with a smaller size, because you would end up wanting to do things that you really wouldn't be able to get yourself set up to do. I don't think I'm not as familiar with N scale as what I should be, but it it just seems like. HO was the best choice here for this, especially mm -hmm. for a starting type thing. Yeah, for sure. So they do have, if you look up Port of Montana uh, dot, dot org, they do have some things on their website. They have a YouTube presence. Um, there's a handful of videos on YouTube. Um, there's, if you look at, look up POM, POM, P-O-M, as reporting marks on railroadpicturearchives.net, they are on there. Um, also, if you're just looking for their locomotive, if you look up the what is it, the, the 3641, the NRE 3641, you'll find it on there. And then they're also on railpictures.net. There's several photos on there um, of of the railroad. I not a whole lot of any of the other social media stuff, not a big Facebook, almost no Facebook, anything like that, that I could find. Um, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's about it for, that's about it for our short line of the show. I, I, it's small because the railroad was smaller. There isn't a whole lot right. out there on this. Well, but, I think you, I think you filled the time pretty good. But our next one is going to, we're moving to Nebraska. And as requested by one Thomas Gazer, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I am going to do a twofer on Nebraska by going into the Wayback Machine. And I'm going to do a little then and now on a, on a short line that Ooh. I've got slotted for this. Yeah. Then and now? A little then and now, yeah. Yeah, so that is Nebraska's short line of the show the next time we get around to doing one. Okay. Well so, done, Mike. Yeah, and I think a lot of guys are going to like the Nebraska one uh, it, because um, it is it's pretty cool. It's actually going to be pretty sweet. So, um, but yeah, Montana's awesome. If you get a chance, if you're out in the silver, silver bowl area or, uh, you know, go check it out, you know? Yeah. I think that's a, might be a destination rail fan spot for sure. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's really cool. Yeah. So, so, well, um, short line of the show is over. Back at the ranch, Boomer is back at the layout. How you guys? How you doing? What's been going on? We uh, had you off camera. Doing a little bar jobs here. Classifying <laughs> 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 a few tankers. I was, you know, watching uh, the short line of the show. I like that grain elevator. Wasn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool? Again, there's another one. It, just like you're saying once in a while, Boomer, you know, in some of your videos, you know, it's it's just it, it look it's a square structure, a, a vertical square tube with you know other host grain bins with yeah. it. And it, it it's not hard to build a, you know, again, another it looks hard, 
would probably be a fairly decent, you know, beginning project for a guy, you know. So yeah, there it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right on. Hey, hey, Mike, I like that the scale of the grain elevator and that uh was that a that a uh, SW fifteen hundred or twelve hundred again? An SW thirteen. Okay. It was a, yeah. a Duke Sorry, Andy. I just yeah. wanted to tell you that I wasn't ignoring. I was watching that and the scale. No, no. Eh? Like I was picturing that grain elevator, like what it would look like in HO, right? It's quite large, eh? Like yeah, like bigger than any buildings I have. Yeah, William Sampson actually makes a really good point about that. He did that with his layout where the head house on one of his uh, grain elevators is like 95 feet high. And then they keep 150 feet high. Is it 150? I thought you said 95. No, No, 150 feet. And then you look at the you you look at the Walters one and it is so far. Yeah, it's so far out of proportion. You know, so I mean it's 150 feet high. Oh yeah, and he's got it. It's almost two feet. (laughs) Oh 40. (laughs) Yeah, so yeah, it's uh yeah, it's it's big. It's big, right? It's big. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, and and that's but those you go to you go to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and that those those structures dominate the skyline, right? You know, so that's <laughs> so this is uh like this opening aperture opening, like to the yeah. valance, you know, to the valance and the you know the fascia here to the lighting valance, like my viewing aperture. Yeah. Uh is uh 15 inches <laughs> so like when you're standing you know back like this right like you don't see the tops of the trees like you don't see the the framework right right, right. um i might even lower this actually glover road was only nine inches view but you don't notice it right like like it like it really makes it immersive because you just see like it's hard to explain. It's like a letterbox movie. You know how you watch right. lights? Yeah. And uh, so when you, like, you don't need that much of an opening. Like, you don't even think about it, but you don't see any of the frame above and, you know, a lot of the skyline. It's kind of interesting kind of effect. But anyway, just thought I'd mention that because you're talking about tall buildings. Like, if you were oh, to yeah. model a grain elevator like that, in this case, you wouldn't even build the top of the, or if you did, it would be. I mean, it would be there if you looked up, but it, like you wouldn't see it as you were operating, kind of like right. visual, visual wise. Right. But, but it's cool, right? Because that's what's cool about a valance, like a overhead valance. You can letterbox the scene, no matter what it is. Thomas Gazer does that on Split Rock with his birch trees. Right. Yeah. 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 So he's got a bunch of white sticks, like like detailed white sticks, and you don't really see the the canopy of the tree at all. Right. Uh, just holding that 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 question there, uh, Chris Bell, because there's something I want to mention about that letterbox and scale, like larger scales as well. But I want to, uh, Andy, that uh, that question. Uh, sorry, there's a I got a piece of real rail in the. Oh yeah, it's uh, how how long of how long of a train do you plan to run? Okay, and then, so and then he yeah. has staging, like a sort of question mark. So how yeah. long? Okay, so uh, I figured I might try to explain this. Um, so. Right here, so you have this two MU units that do a lot of the work, right? And you can see I've got like an idler car here, which you don't really. Uh, people have talked about idler cars and they have reasons for why they use them, but I know in the SRY, like there's a video I have of the carrier princess and the guys, the engineer guys talking to the guy. You say, no, that doesn't have to do with weight. We can drive the locomotive right onto the ramp and right onto the ferry. It's because of when the tide was at a different level when the, it would pinch like down like that and it, uh, it wouldn't uncouple from the locomotive, right? Ah. Uh-huh. Yeah. The way the couplers were, uh, the way the couplers were adjusted on the idler car compensated for that. So they wouldn't lose the tank cars, right? <laughs> Rolling back into the ferry yeah. off the other end. It had nothing to do with weight or restriction or with a barge it might, cause they have a different buoyancy factor, but the carrier princess was, I don't know what the displace, it was a displacement hull, right? So didn't have any problem with yeah, weight of the car. The yeah. But it's probably still they probably still had to like balance the weight on the barge. I mean, oh sure they do. Yeah, they go center, then left, right, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, for sure, Mike. Yeah. But uh 
I had heard people say, oh, yeah, that's because of weight. Well, it's not just for weight. It was so they didn't lose the couple, uh, a coupler. They didn't break couplers. Uh, hmm. When they had to go down, like when the uh, tide, the ramp, like it goes like this, right? Right. Yeah. It's never perfectly level. They try to get level tide, but it's never like that. That's why with this barge, uh, maybe I can turn the light to see it better. Um, that's why this barge here. Yeah. It pivots in the middle right here. So it pivot there. And it goes like this. Right. On, oh, wow. On, uh, I got to watch. I don't want a short leash here. But uh, <laughs> there's these hydraulic, uh, there's an I-beam underneath the front of this. And these two towers is an upside down hydraulic and lifts the ramp up and down to line up to the carrier princess. So if the tide's high, this uh, pivot point is not going to be totally level to the approach ramp. Like the right. ramp and the approach is going to be different. So to compensate for that, they use these idler cars. They had a different adjustment on the couplers or whatever. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because people had asked about it and I thought I could show, just describe That's a really it. really good depiction. Yeah. So the cars, like, uh, you can uh, 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 pull, like, like. so here's the problem. So because <laughs> I built, yeah, right, okay, because <laughs> uh, right? there's no room, right? It, you, know, you know what I mean? It's always the same old story, right? Uh, there's no room. Um, you know, there's no room prototypically. This might go back to, you know, our mud father's question. Um there's yep. no room prototypically like I had to like this length here like is not prototypical length to the actual prototype barge approach. Right. Like if it was, it right. would need 14 feet or something like that. Like this is 14 feet up here, but this is still the lead though to switch the, I need more lead depending on how many cars I pull off the barge or the ferry or that are in here somewhere. Okay, so I'll just uh, – so you can have a, a string of cars. That's where they go when you classify them, down there. Oh, up the – Oh, I got or, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So – And I suppose that's why you put that derail at the end of the brewery spurs, so in case you needed to shove back, you kind of you know, forget about it. It'll just go on the – I got it. I yeah, get right. it. Yeah, instead of going into the drink, I... instead of going into the drink, it goes onto the floor, right? My Catherine Genesis 85. Right, car, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, put a uh, pillow at the end of the layout. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, a pillow down below, yeah. yeah. Or a trash can, right? No. There you but, go. Um, so uh, – if you're um, pull, like loading or pulling cars off the main here, off the barge, all the way down there onto the ferry now, too, which will hold another three cars on the – well, nine on the ferry. I'm just doing half the ferry, but that's for another time. But I need all this lead. If I'm pulling, like, nine cars off at one – like, you know, bang, 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 like three s sections of cars, that's nine, right? Yeah. This is a lead to service the barge slip so that I can pull back far enough to clear the frog in order to, it's right here to push down here to classify them. And then when they're ready to go, the turn, they call it right off, they go down off the other side of the layout onto a cassette. So it's like bridge traffic operation, right? Yeah. Empties come, empties coming in. Empty cars coming in from Vancouver Island, petroleum, fuel. That's what they do, like, right now. There's a uh, industry over there, uh, liquid petroleum fuel, and they used to do grain as well. So they're coming in empty, right? They're yeah. offloading empties, and then they're shoving on uh, full loads. So that, so that's what I – that's this part of the operation. The barge operations – that's what it encompasses. This is all like that's all I can model or operate is loading and offloading the barge and then making them go down and disappear and they're gone. Meanwhile, I have, you know, trans load for steel coils for axe and steel. I got two clients over here for box cars. There's a drop and a turn there. 
and then there's one at the brewery, right? That's all in, in, yeah, technically 10 feet, but I need this lead to service the barge. And this, I also need to service uh, uh, Ipex Plastics down here to pull all those pellet cars. Yeah. So the prototype pulls eight pellet cars. I can't pull eight pellet cars. I have to compress operations too. Like the most uh, pellet cars I'm going to pull realistically in a functional way if I was operating with two people because there's two blocks. I can pull the tank cars from this yard. It also goes to the barge slip. It's prototypical because it's where they stick the idler cars here, right? <laughs> but I have to do it. But I have to pull them all out into this yard here and then do a run around up here on the main or down this track, right? To yeah. get around to take the cars back to New West or whatever. So it all works, right? But it's it's a tight operation. It's a short line operation. So the scenes are compressed, but also you have to compress your trains too. Right. So we're always living with the imaginary world, aren't we? Right. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like so, so you, uh, sorry? No, I was gonna say, so you have to crush your trains then too, right? Yeah, you gotta crush the train. <laughs> Figuratively. Like <laughs> Figuratively. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you got to compress down or crush the scene and the operations, but you're still getting the same. I mean, you're still, it's model railroad. Right. You're modeling a railroad, but you don't get the luxury. Okay, so if I had the luxury to build this, this scene, just this barge slip and the prototypical lead, this section here, which doubles as a just a quick... Uh, spirit of new west and then now it becomes a lead to to also service the grain elevator but not quite it'll be there's more, quite a bit of lead for the grain elevator but they all like this real railroady section that i really like that i get to come and stare mm -hmm. at in the morning becomes this overlapping leads to both ends of the layout so oh, cool. so you you could have two operators with nc controllers whatever uh, with tons of room, I think it's eight feet across. It's a horseshoe layout. Like I didn't want no duck hunters and no like none of this. Yeah, like, right. No, like it's not happening, right? That's a that's a druther, right? You know, so you can still do it. And then there's the you know you have to do the British style, uh, which was uh, you know adopted by you know the Brits, right? The diorama cassette staging style of layout right yeah like the smaller yeah. cassette style that they do right you know i know a guy that's building the end scale european layout with an elevator with uh like his staging goes he's got three levels and it's got a hydraulic uh <laughs> yeah no no i'm serious he, he pushed like, like a cassette the onto, yeah yep. but it has a jack screw and it goes down to the next level. Then they go off and others can come on. It goes up and down like because of space and, you know, the imaginary world. Like, I think it was Tony Coaster uh, that said, like, un unquote, but I think he said in one of his books, um, a shelf layout or a point to point, which is what this is, should have stub staging at each end. Yeah. All right. You have to be able to come in and off the imaginary world. Right. We, yep. You know. Like the theater, like the model railroad exists. A lot of the the railroad, probably ninety five percent of your railroad exists in the theater of your mind, right? <laughs> and and uh, yeah, like you try to model that five percent to make it believable and immersive for you, that to, to suit your hobby interest, right? And that's what I'm trying to do with River Road. Uh, but you know, like I'm quite pleased so far because the track is very reliable. I really worked hard on the track, and I'm not done yet because I got to right lay this other track, the the other thirty percent of it. Uh, but I spent a lot of it. Like remember when I said it's total agony? Yeah. <laughs> like some, yeah. some some of it was like oh geez, you know, like getting no really, it's a lot of work. But boy, is it ever worth it, you know? And uh, uh, like uh, the way I changed the plan and I evolved the plan, which I'll talk about some other time. I'll show you what I did, but, you know, like I had to tweak a few things, but I'm really happy the way I can really get around on this layout, like from one end to another and do turns on both ends without clogging the main. Yeah. 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 So, so then operations is another one of those, I guess, 
Well, you got to be able to do runarounds, right? Like in a point to point, you got to be able to bypass. Right. So, so planned out operations, right, is another is another, I guess, concept in in living with your layout, right? Yeah, right on, Andy. Like, yeah, exactly. Carry on. and then the other the other aspect is I appreciate that by the way the other aspect is reliability then right you have to oh yeah yeah I mean how how fast would you burn out or, or chuck it out if if cars couldn't stay on the rails I mean who cares about uh, you know how we talked about shrinkage right remember talking before the show we were setting things up and mm-hmm. and, and I was talking about how this is all on three uh, H uh, Baltic Birch seven plywood right with quarter inch cork right yep. Not completely cork, but only the areas where the track goes, and then it can cut into the cork, kind of do shallow ditches, stuff like that. The paved areas are all balsa wood because it's light and stable, and I can drill holes and carve easy. Put, you know what I mean? Um, but I have had a little bit of shrinkage because you'll always get it, right? Yep. Boomer, what do you there have is a for? question here, and I'll, I'll, I'll queue it up um, yeah. at, after you're done here. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, we were talking about like expansion, retraction, like plywood mm-hmm. is probably one of the more stable. Well, okay. I'm not going to talk about spline road bed because that's a whole nother thing. And that's the proper way to do, you know, the long runs, the long tangents and curves through a layout, like the bench work that L girded with spline road bed is, is the way to go for that. But on a shelf layout where you're down in the weeds and it's, you know, last mile flat switching and stuff, I think plywood is your best friend, but it does move though. But the better the quality of the plywood, it doesn't matter thickness, doesn't mean better quality. It's the ply, like like Baltic birch ply is pretty hard to beat. It's expensive, but it goes a long ways if you use it properly. But it doesn't move laterally very much. But if it does, and I do have a small spot um, in here, um, I have a spot. Uh, if I can just move these trains, it's the reliable transformer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of a little bit of a dip here where this ditch is, and ironically, it happened there with the flooding, like this the artificial flooding, like you know, I modeled it's a flood area, right? There's a little slight dip, but I talked about that, like on the class one main down here on CN's dual main, it's 70 miles an hour. There's a big dip. You can see it. I should take a photo of it. It's been there for five years. Every time I cross the tracks, I look to see if they fixed it. No, they're all, like, they're good with it. Like you can see it. Like it's welded real. It's just like this roller coaster. Whoa, man. Unit train, 70 miles an hour. They're okay with it. On short lines, there's dips everywhere. When I was at the Milner grain elevator, the guy told me that unloaded used to winch a windlass to pull the car. He said, he said, I had a car get a, get away on me one time. If it wasn't for the derail, he said it would have went right out into the intersection. It's only like a point two or three percent grade. Once oh, a grain yeah. car gets roll, oh yeah. Once a grain car gets rolling, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh if it's going downhill, the next thing we always we, we we've got several because where I work, everything is on a hill. On each, in each direction, there isn't a level spot on the whole area, so you're either yeah, going down, tips, right? you're going downhill either to the east or downhill to the north. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so and and uh, our big thing is w- talk about dips. We we're, the saying we always tell everybody is, uh, don't turn around. You you yeah. don't want to yeah. If you're going if you're going forward or you're going in one direction yeah. Don't turn around and look at what the cars are doing behind you. You just don't want to see that because they're doing they're they're flapping back and forth. They're going and you could actually sometimes the ones right next to the engine you could actually feel them when they bottom out on the sides. They're they're swaying so much and that's at ten mile an hour. But I mean our track is that's only in one or two little spots. But yeah, it's uh. Yeah, there's dips and little everything all over the place, you know. Welded rail, jointed rail. Jointed rail is worse than welded rail, but, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, so that's probably the only place that I noticed a dip over the last couple of years. And I'm okay with it because it's like that on the SRY. Like, I'm all over that railroad <laughs> happened for years. And it goes like, <laughs> no, literally, right? Like, I should also take photos. Like, there's one area that goes through uh, Fort Langley, like, further up. And it's literally like a like a hill. Like, you won't believe it. Like, it goes way down there and then up. And then there's little areas 
flooded areas, like so that's the way it is. That's the way the prototype is. And if it's not severe, like who cares if it's on your model railroad? You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. If it's livable. So that's probably uh, apart from the track is pretty good. I was surprised I got off easy there, I think, because there is because your layout's gonna shrink when the wood dries out. I have a question for you there, Boomer. Yeah. So where'd the bus go? <laughs> oh, the bus. Uh, <laughs> yeah, where did I put did the did, bus? Did the, bu did the bus take off? And and then oh, the, yeah. follow a follow-up question. Here it is. Look, it's got wires underneath it. It's a Rapido bus, eh? No, oh, one of those Rapido. A follow-up yeah. question is: Is They're the guy quite the, nice? Eh? Is They're the guy actually... in the tow truck on lunch? Is he like in the corner now because he's on taking a break? Oh, yeah, he's, he got, was... he's got the flask in the back pocket. Too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Things, are slow. Things are slow. Things are slow. <laughs> I knew guys that were tow truck drivers, and uh, you know they like the you know. <laughs> <laughs> Put but, a little um, whiskey in their coffee. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So since you brought my attention, so here's the diner. Uh, let me just read the camera because I know Dennis, if he's still here, uh, like I'll show he you. Is. I don't yeah. like to do this because the people's sensitive viewing and Dennis does. So what a Dennis, okay, the finger, I'll do this for Dennis. As long as there's a finger there, I guess. Does that work, Dennis? Oh, you took the warehouse out and put the diner in there. That's the reason why. Yeah, I'll just put it there for now. So just to show it, because it does kind of look cool there, but I mean, it's almost like, okay, so it's an empty parking lot. But the movie company put it there for a shot for a film. You know what I mean? Like in that genre kind of whimsical sense. But it does look kind of neat there. So it actually is acceptable there on a Sunday afternoon if I wanted to backdate the scene or something. You know. Yeah. That would be kind of fun to put that in every now and then. That's fun. That's I mean cool that was one. the idea, but uh, prototypical influence. Can I live with it? Can I live with it there? Well, yes and no. I mean, I know there's people that like it, and I know why they like it, but no, I can't live with it there once IPEX Plastics is in place. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But anyway, that's for because the... if, if you put it there, then you have nowhere to put that other that 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 other building, and you know. Right, I mean, there's no other place on the layout that that other building would, would, uh, would fit. Is yeah, there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and when the overpass is in there, and Ipex Plastics is built, which is my next building project. Um, but I'll be doing some other stuff in turn because this was my last build, and I'm kind of exhausted from architecture for now. You go through phases, right? Okay, I'm tired of architecture, <laughs> and then do a bit of scenery, <laughs> some cars, train, whatever, and then back again. Um, it'll look really cool with that prototypical scene looking under the overpass i'm really stoked about that and seeing ipex plastic and you know with the sd35 and the pulling the plastic offers it's gonna be awesome that one for sure right like and the track veering off and then the road like this all this buried track i'm gonna do like mm. uh duncan way right but i freelance the curve area which is for other content coming up soon but this winter, but uh, you'll see, I'm going to do this. I think there'll be, four, yeah, four tracks there or three, but it's going to be kind of cool. And I'm going to have all the crack pavement and a whole new chapter there that I'm really excited about. Oh, that'll be awesome. Yeah. Because I uh, see that... those plastic copper cars Atlas put out a bunch, right? I got a, I, I grabbed a bunch when they're wrong. I can't find any more though. I wish I would have grabbed more. They're the, uh, uh, you know, they're the, okay. Uh, 5,800 plastic hopper cars, a ACF. Anyway, you'll see them soon, but yeah, they're, you know, they have the special offload. They use vacuums. Like that's going to be a big, yeah. Project. Yeah. Like that's going to be a oh. big build, right? Cause I'm doing the, well, it's compressed, but I'm doing the building and then I'm doing the vacuum system, you know, and when they, and then the spur beside it where they flop, uh, you know, swap them back and forth. It's an awesome place to see a real local working because you can watch it right there. It's a public road, public sidewalk. They're pretty good if you stay away from the equipment or unless you ask permission, right, mm. um, to watch, like to switch. And if you're driving through there, you're stuck. 
you're not moving until they're done. So right. it's a re really, really cool uh, local if you ever catch it. But you never know. It's You know, I've caught it a few times. I've been lucky. But, hmm. yeah. Any more questions out there, Andy, that we missed? Yeah, there was a couple. So uh, one one person asked, and, and kind of getting back to operations here, um, do you have a proto throttle? Um, no. And what, so what do you use for uh, cab control? Oh, NCE. NCE power cab. Yep. Yeah. So I have a consist here. So uh, I want to clear that consist. So I'm going to uh, clear it's number 127, which is those two there. I just cleared it. So now they're there independent. Now, like, that's how easy it is. Like, I can make a consist, yeah. like, just as fast. And then uh, let's see, uh, select local 381. Lights oh, off. Lights, off. Yeah, lights off. Yeah. And turn the, the sound on. Like, they all have, like, they're all, actually, this one's TCS. Um, I don't think you'll be able to. Oh, know, yeah. You, oh, it comes through. Dead? Yeah. Loud and clear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's the bell. Yeah. The nice thing, uh, I'll say one thing about TCS that low sound ESU just does not have. Like you know, I'm an ESU low sound version five fan, right? Like all my locomotives are right. ESU yeah. for for uh, compatibility. Like I know, you know, JMR and they're all compatible and NMRA standards. I get that. Thank goodness for the NMRA because they do push the standard and it's important to all of us. But things fall between the cracks with manufacturing. I like I like I think TCS is good. I'll say that right now. Like if I didn't have didn't stumble into ESU local version five, it would have been probably doing TCS. Okay. I know I have some uh, tsunami two units, but I don't run them. So I can't say whether they're good decoders or not. They are apparently, but I just don't run them. And this is TCS, but you cannot beat um, the horn quill on TCS. Yeah. Like you can't do that with low version yeah. five. For some reason, they're sort of like they're uh, they're baked in, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like uh, watch this. Like, like I don't know if you can hear this. Like, they have some programmed personality in some of them. Like, about 12 different here. Look. <laughs> and then this one. That's one track. Unreal. Another one. That's why I like TCS. Uh, the only thing I don't like about TCS, and I know you can get around it, is if I want to do this here, watch. Like if I put the headlight on, right? It's cool, right? Like they're all ideas. They look might look funny on the screen, but they don't really look mm. like that. They're golden. But so if I want to put on the uh, ditch lights, I have to program, go into program and change some stuff, or I got to go like this. Night mode active. <laughs> and light mode active, and then put the ditchers on, and then go back to sound mode active. Right? But I can't turn the, the, uh, Ditch lights now become the bell. And I don't like that. Huh. Like, that's not a deal breaker, but that's what you have to live with if you're not program savvy. Night mode active. Right? So I want to uh, run my ditch lights. Sound mode active. With just two presses. That's it. Like, I want to yeah. run my, my uh, main light. So uh, if I go to... Uh, Select local 122, the Jeep 9 down the road there, right? See why I put the headlight on? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I just hit six, and there's the ditches. So 
if I'm coming off the, the or coming onto the main, I go ditch. If I go off the main, I can just turn the ditches while I'm moving. Yeah. Right? Right. I can't do, I can't do that with with this default programming. I have to start I the there's locomotive. A, there's got to be a way to map that on the Well, yeah, there yeah. is, right? There yeah. is, but that's not my specialty. Yeah. Like uh, that's not my interest. Right? <laughs> like I don't want to be like I'm not with Loke version five, there's a, a quick way to do all your back EMF and and like uh, you know the notching. This is it's like all my ESUs just notch eight, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's it, and it's just not just like the real thing, and they crawl. So that's why I still think TCS is great, but hashtag no sponsor, hashtag no sponsor, right? <laughs> uh, TCS or Lok Sound or or Tsunami. They all have their differences and they all fit whoever, you know, like they're all have good things about them. But the one thing I love again, TCS is their horn quill beats everyone. So if you're into that. I know a lot of people who are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good, good horn quality. I know my son would love that because uh, he's got the number two button pressed the whole way around the layout. So you would just love that. But uh, you can't beat like that's just a Walters with one flywheel. It's not even my best friend. But you like it, it's really hard to beat uh, the motor control on ESU. Yeah, like, yeah. it's this superb, right? Um, like I mentioned about this MP15 uh, is my best runner, right? If I link this up, like MU this with Loke Sound, this is Loke Sound, I'll never have any problems with this locomotive. Yeah. Because this is so reliable. Like, it'll pull it through the, the glitch. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll never even notice it, right? I can run this alone. Like, I don't have to worry. I have full confidence with this locomotive everywhere on the layout, like when I'm operating. Like, it doesn't hesitate or fail. This one does sometimes. It's Walther's. Now <laughs> uh, the Cato runs like silk, but it's not meant for low end switching. But it once it's at like notch three, four, it's hard to beat a Cato. Hmm. Yeah, oh, they're beautiful running locomotives, right? I don't know anything about scale trains, Andy. Like you have them, so I'm not going to say anything about that. But I'll find out soon when they come up with yeah, it. Yeah, right. You see hydros, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I I've run I've run them a lot, and um, they come with the ESU Loke Sound Five in them. And I tell you what, I have a pair of SD forty dash twos that pull my ore train, and they will go right from a from a standstill. I can crawl them, and their their motor can their motors are really good, in my opinion. I think they're better than Atherin Genesis. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so you can live with them. I love them. I absolutely yeah. love them. Yeah. yeah, that's part of living with your layout, like, too, right? Is is the track up to stuff, yeah. and are and are your? I think it was Lance Minheim said on his blog. He was saying, uh, "What did he say? Run your best running locomotive, not your best looking one." Hmm. Yep. Yep. Now, some would say, well, no, I don't want to. I like my, you know, Dash 9 scale. You know, they look uh, awesome. Okay, fine. But if you're operating, a real immersion killer is when they stall. You're halfway into kind of a fulfilling, after a hard day's work, uh, half an hour, you know, flipping a box car or something or some hoppers and the thing, you know, you're almost ready, right? Feels good when you complete the whole op, right, without the locomotive glitching out or dying on you yeah you know yeah yeah so. so that's good so we're approaching hour three here of our time oh, wow. with, yeah. yeah if time flies when you're right. having fun um and so i do want to give uh, an opportunity to the section crew here um to ask any final questions before we tie down for tonight call it an evening and let Boomer get back on with his day. But I, I want to just check <laughs> check in with Mike real real quick. Um, what do you, I mean, talking about operations, 
I know that you've recently um, have been working on your layout and and really getting the track work done. And I think you posted a video recently about um, your you, that the bridge and and some of the yep. turnouts. How how much time do you put into getting the track work just right? Well, to to kind of reiterate what Boomer was saying before is you know and just said you know that the track on the layout is without a doubt to me at least the most important aspect of the entire thing without 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 a good quality running layout without good track work uh it it's just not you're not going to hold it it's not going to hold your interest um the scenery can always be changed everything else like that or or if you make mistakes in those things but if your track work is not reliable then you're forever going to be cursing that section and eventually you'll just not use it and yeah. so it i spend i because i hand lay the whole layout I can sit there and um, like I just posted photos of uh, like it, it's a it's technically a crossover, but it's really just the other end of the siding, and one track is going to go into the engine facility, and the other track goes you know into another switch. But um, th that were the two the two frogs of the switch, and that what I have there in those photos on my Farland terminal page. And and I believe I put it on our our second section page also, but um, that took me like two hours to do two two and a half hours to take put together, and because I gauged, I actually gauged and spiked down the two frogs yep. for I I put the two frogs in first where they're supposed to be, and then I gauged off of the first wing rail of the frog. And made sure that was where it was supposed to be, and I kept going from there. And um, and so uh, it, that took me over an hour to do alone. Yeah. And so I I have no problems if I can. I, I've pulled up portions like a foot of it already because all of a sudden I'm finding myself kind of getting out of gauge for some reason. I'll take back not just the out of gauge part, but about a foot past that and then relay that whole thing to make sure everything is tight where it's supposed to be. So I spend a lot of time on the track because I, I don't have a lot of it. I just want it to run really, really well. I want people when they come over to have fun with it and sure. to enjoy it. I don't want to have to troubleshoot my track because I didn't put it in the right way. And 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 there's no blaming there's when when you hand lay, it's a little different than when you're using commercial track, and I'm sure Boomer will, Boomer will agree with me on this. Is that when you're using nothing but commercial track, you there are adjustments you can make to it, but for the most part, it's coming right out of the box from the manufacturer. Engage for the most part, you just kind of put it down, and you just kind of can really blast through quite a bit in a short period of time. They're the only people to really blame for something being out of gauge is if, if it gets broken or if, you know, if it's all boogered up for some reason. But with hand laying, everything's on you. It's your, you're responsible for that gauge. You're responsible for how it's, how it's put down. And so it's really, it makes it a lot, makes it a lot more, um satisfying i guess when i do a, a two foot section hand laying it and i know for a fact that i can take my track gauge and that thing just drops right in there and it's perfect mm -hmm. uh, i can go to bed with a smile on my face and even though i only <laughs> did two feet i'm sitting there going wow i got a lot done tonight i got a lot done tonight you know and and I don't, I don't, I can go and turn my layout on right now. And I know for a fact that I will not have one derailment. 
Yeah. So, you know, and that's, no, I can't say that there isn't, I've, I'm having some switch point issues at a couple of locations, but that is like a contact issue. So it's just a matter of me going in and making some adjustments and the track itself is all good. It's just making some point adjustments and that's all I need to do with that. And then, but I, I don't know, Boomer, what do you think? I mean, the, the track work, you know, is, it's got to be key, right? Yeah, well, Hanley track, too, you can repair it easy as well, I find, too, right? Right. You pull up some spice. But uh, can I just uh, – that's really fascinating what Mike's talking about. Can I just answer Tom Johnson's question? Because he said, uh, what, uh, yeah, uh, what uh, throttle system – so NCE, right, <laughs> power cab, that's all I need because um, it's it's just a small layout and uh, I only run two or three locomotives on the layout at a time right so I don't need uh, anything else really it works for me and and uh, hey if it works don't fix it yeah right <laughs> but, um, and uh, he raises another one uh, do you have keep in your locomotives no but I am changing them over like uh, this TCS has a, a built-in keep alive. Uh, on the uh, DCC decoder, which um, is kind of cool because it's, I have to worry about, I don't really worry about any sort of dirty spots on the track because it just runs. Like it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't die anywhere. Uh, I mean, the track is clean anyway. I keep it clean. It's easy to clean. Uh, this MP15 is not keep alive, but I don't need to keep alive on it. If I put a keep alive on, it won't make no difference because it's so reliable. It runs. It just runs. It just blows right through. I think I said two lines in the sand and I mean it. It's not good. Yeah. Uh, my other locomotives, my SD35, I have new ESU Loke Sound version 5 keep alive. The ones that are built in. It's not an add-on. It's, it's the new ones that are soldered right to the board. They're built. Actually, they're engineered into the board. They're the same size as the older ones. Yeah. They're great, right? And those are going in my SD35 and my other switchers, keep alives. Because mm. I think it's the way to go. Like if like if you have a small fleet and you're not too far ahead of yourself, and uh, you know, to think that to switch them out would be uh, not practical or economical, but uh, I'm doing that, yeah. So to answer your question, NCE power cab, and yes, I'm putting keep alives on all my operational uh, locomotives for River Road. And, then, and yes, uh, Mike, sorry, yes, Mike, right. uh, Hanley track is the way to go uh, if you have the fortitude to do it. And then, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chris, so to, Chris to uh, Holschbach said, uh, will you have a ferry or float or just the slip? Yeah, so I'm building uh, like a, like I will build just the, the plain Jane slab of a barge uh, for the other side. And possibly this side, but I've I already have in the plans. I have all the photos, I have all the research and a rough plan, and I'm building the carrier princess, the first 40% of it, which will hold nine cars. I'm building the whole thing so it mates up to the front of the barge slip, which when I showed it on the last video, it looks plain on the front. That's just a piece of tape that's painted. I peel that tape off. And it's raw plastic, and that's going to get modeled with the connection hard points. But I'm not going to do that until I build the front of the ferry, and then I can match them so it locks in. Because I'm going to have sliders, drawer sliders, that come out from underneath to support the ferry. Oh, right? Oh, that'll be awesome. So when nice. I bring this, so uh, I'll just tilt this because I know we're getting near the end here. So, so when I, uh, so the ferry will be stored. I gotta watch this cable, eh? I'm gonna strangle myself. But uh, <laughs> oh, no. so uh, because the bench work, there's nothing underneath it. Yeah. Right. Like it's all open, right? There's, so I'm gonna build drawers for all my, you know, like draw, like drawers that come out for the cars, tank yep. cars here. Let's say the box cars here, and then the ferry's gonna have its own compartment drawer under here, the print, the carrier princess, so I can pull it out pull the sliders out, slide the ferry because there's enough water space here. It'll lock into the front so I can basically offload and load tank cars, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I take the cars, when they go to Vancouver Island, I take the ferry off and I just slide it under here. Wow. And, cool. and they're gone. 
right? And then when they come back in, declared empty, I bring it back up, and then, and then I do an ops, and I pull, classify the cars. I mean, that might be between an op that stops for a while too, right? I might suspend for something else. And then I'll pull them up here. I can pull them up into this yard here and reclassify them. I can classify them on the brewery alley lead, which is the main, actually. And then off they go, you know, to the other side, staging to, uh, you know, wherever that that goes, right, into the imaginary world. That's how you have to do it with a shelf layout. But I I can live with that. Yeah. No problem. So... That's the justification yeah. for a, a small shelf layout that you can still serve all your modeling needs. Uh, you can be just as immersed regardless of ops. It's last mile ops, you know, or location industry ops um, in a 10 by 12 room. That's tidy and a bench underneath. It's it's perfect for me. So you, you know? can live you you can live with your layout. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have no yeah. rush to finish it either. I want to share as much as I can. Uh, you know, I can't cover every pin I drop, but I want to share as much as I can because I think it'll be valuable. I should say this most most notably because the veterans already know how to do this. You know, they've been like the guys and gals even, you know, that have been in this hobby for a long time get it because of the experience. You know, they've made 10,000 mistakes, you know with the 10,000 hours that they have. Yeah. Right. You know? And so it was essential that they made them just because someone tells you what they all are. Doesn't mean you shouldn't make them or you won't make them, but it's just part of the journey. That's the anguish part that leads to the bliss and the reward of this. Right. But yeah, I can live with this layout. It doesn't have to be big. I don't need to go in circles. I know like I get why people do that. But I don't want duck hunters, and I want to run my railroad point to point like the real railroad does, right? Like, to me, yeah. they don't run in circles, so it doesn't matter to me. But right. I know why people do it, though. I totally get it. Like, I could do that. I could decompress after work and watch trains go around. Like, I understand <laughs> that. But I don't need it. You know, I don't need to do that. Yeah. And, uh, and and the shelf layout, I think, now is is a layout that, I think the younger generation should look into because it can serve all your needs and fulfill all your desires. It doesn't matter. Like you could have a massive layout. It's not going to make any difference to how you like it or whether you can live with it. Because if you can't afford it or you don't have the space or it's becoming a burden, you can't live with it. Right. Right. All, all major factors, <laughs> you, know, you know, cost, <laughs> man. But you that know, like really I say, cool. like just you know, let me close with saying this, that if there's any rumors out here, Boomer doesn't like big layouts or trains that go in circles. Wrong. <laughs> Been there, done that, know all about that. I think, <laughs> I think they're awesome. And they have a place in the hobby, absolutely according to whatever that person likes. Uh, whatever floats their boat or their ferry, have at her, right? Mm. But, there's always, mm. but there's always, it all does this, right? Doesn't it? Yep. It all like it all couples, right? In this yeah. hobby that we all share, yeah. it certainly does. Um, and I think that's a, a great a great spot to close um, this evening's show. So I I, I do want to um, just say thank you to the to the section crew this evening. Um, great chat, great comments. I know um, there's there's always a lot of stuff going on, and I do apologize if I don't get all of the questions comments up on screen. Um, there was a lot of them tonight um, that were coming I'll try in. to answer some. Like, I'll go tomorrow or when it's archived, I'll visit and uh, yeah. I'll re-watch some of it. And if I can, if, uh, you know, I'll try to maybe answer some of them uh, if yeah. I miss some of them. Yeah. And then I did I did uh, put a link to Boomer's uh, channel um, in the show notes here on, on, on the um, – on the YouTube uh, live stream this evening. So make sure you check that out. Um, if you have not uh, visited his channel, make sure you check out all the tutorials, the philosophy. Uh, it's, it's essentially, I guess I'll use the word masterclass to use uh, terms from our generation, right? 
on on how to build um, not only with the River Road project he had, but now or not with Glover Road and now with River Road, um, how to really immerse yourself in your model railroad. So I I have to say thank you, Boomer, um, for taking the time. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. This is your third time. You're welcome. You are Pleasure. Two, sh two shows away from being a five-timer and in the five-timer club like on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, you'll, you'll have to work. You'll have to work your way back to that. But again, I truly appreciate the time and uh, the, you know, the willingness to put this on. And live from your layout room was amazing this evening. That I know we didn't so get cool. <laughs> it was it was outstanding. And I, I can't thank you enough. Um, so that being said, um, we will be back. I believe it's uh, the 17th. We'll be putting on another live stream. Um, and then we'll be back on the 24th as well and the 31st. So we're up in our game here once a week um, here on the second section. We got some mystery guests showing up on the 24th. We're not going to tell you who it is, so you have to be sure to tune in and 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 check us out on the 24th. That'll be fun awesome. um, for, for, for the crew here. Um, and then, again, if you haven't uh, liked the show this evening, you like the content, make sure you like, subscribe. Um, to the channel here so you don't miss anything from us here at the second section so mike any last words before we close up for tonight just thanks boomer i mean right. every, every time we get a chance to talk with you i, I learned so much and you know it's just uh like like andy said it's just a master class on on how the philosophies alone are are worth its weight at gold you know, it, it's it's Worth the just, cost of a mission. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. just it, you know, you're a you're a credit to the hobby and a credit to the craft. You're a credit to the art world. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate thank it. You for sharing. Well, thank yeah. you very much for having me. I really appreciate you guys. So, you know, cheers and happy modeling to everybody. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. <laughs>